3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Elijah Campbell, this is the final Thursday of March, which means tomorrow will be the final Friday of March. How about that? Am I right? I flew by. I think so. I think I'm right. Yeah, you know, you're all right. Uh, I need you Wednesday. to talk for a second. Those of you who are watching on YouTube, I apologize for this. I just got into the studio. I was uh, in the production room cutting a commercial for uh, one of our great clients, AAA Heating and Air. And uh, my microphone stand is all messed up. But if I try to me if I try to mess with it while it's operational, it'll sound horrible. Ooh, gross. So I'll let Elijah, uh, you know, sing one of his favorite songs for about 10 seconds while I readjust this live on the air. Yeah, well, actually, one of my best party tricks that I can do and I take really good pride in this, is that I can name all 50 states of the United States in out perfect alphabetical order in sometimes under 25 seconds. Wow. All right, I'm back now. So do you want to do that, or do you want to save that maybe for later in the show, or the oh, fourth can, hour? I can do it whenever. I can do it on, like, on command. Like okay. that is, it, it's, it's one of my best talents. Uh, I know the South Carolina County's song from when I was in third grade. Also, okay, so I, I, this is a And that's I also an alphabetical order. This is a skill that I learned in the uh, third grade as well, but it's because of a song that we were taught that right. gave us the states in alphabetical order, yeah. and I can just recite them incredibly quickly. That is pretty cool. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll plan that out. Oh, yeah. For a little later on. You can even just spring it on, put it on the spot whenever. I'll, right. I'll, I'll nail it. Yeah, I can, I can do the same with the county thing. That one, that's, that's how ingrained that is. Plus, my kids learn the same song. I, I don't know if that's a statewide thing. I, I'm sure it's not just at, like, because I went to the same school that my children went to. So um, it's been a thing the whole time. I imagine others. I can't. I got to think that's a South Carolina history curriculum staple. Must be across the Palmetto State. How many counties are there here? Forty six. Forty six. Yeah, okay. not very many. I was gonna say it's yeah, not not a lot. Small state. Yeah. yeah. Geographically. Geographically small. No. I think we're in the middle of the pack, uh, population wise. You know, Which is impressive considering the, yeah. the land mass. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's there's not a lot bad of there's a lot of states that don't have a lot of people. I bet you I bet you Metro Richland Lexington has more people than like Wyoming. You know what? I'm I'm very curious about that. Or, <laughs> or at least you know, really close. New Hampshire. Yeah. Like yeah. there are probably there are probably a few counties here that probably that could dwarf the population of New probably. Hampshire. Probably. Anyway, uh, we could do geography and music and other things. We'll get into some sports at some point, too. Guest heavy for you today as we get you ready for uh, South Carolina and Indiana in the Sweet 16. Uh, as Diana Koval tells us in the uh, release today, this is South Carolina's 10th straight game in the Sweet 16. So that's pretty cool. Or 10th straight season making the Sweet 16. What'd I say? 10th straight game. Oh, sorry. Usually in the Sweet 16, if you win, you don't have to play any more Sweet 16 games. Oh, that's true. And if you lose, you don't have to play any more Sweet Oh, yeah, 16 yeah. Games. Well, uh, yeah, 10th. Okay, well, then both are correct, right? Tenth straight sweet game in the Sweet Sixteen. That or or okay, yeah. Either way, there we go. Semantics, words. Yeah. It is the yeah. English language. They they advance into this round a lot. There's that. You're yeah. right. It's what you wouldn't have a yeah. This, the next game would be an Elite Eight game. The tenth straight tournament. I they knew. have they have made the Sweet Sixteen. I knew what I was trying to say. <laughs> I did too, but Thanks. I thought it would be funny. I in, appreciate in a world you, in which it's basically a Groundhog Day, where you're waking up and you got to play a Sweet 16 game all over again. I appreciate that you have my back on that one. But um, our good friend David Kloniger is in Albany. Our good friend Brad Muller is in Albany, and they will both join us. Uh, David coming up at the bottom of this hour might try to squeeze in a little baseball with David as well. Uh, Brad will join us at 4:30. Uh, I did. I'll even read you the text because uh, I think he was trying to be. This is David being nice. Um, and you think I'm kidding. So I texted David yesterday. Um, I said, uh, making sure that we were doing 3.30, which we were. So I said 3.30 tomorrow. I'm assuming you've already checked out the numerous set lists from dead shows at the old Knickerbocker Arena. And he said, I was going to do that, but then I just went on living my life. Ooh. I, I think that was him being nice. You know what? Yeah. That might be that, that's DC being nice. Because if he wanted to, he probably could have said something a whole lot worse. There are emojis that are probably a whole lot worse he could have responded uh, with. Is he not I, a, not a big dead guy? Not a. I, I don't think he. Other than like, I bet you he doesn't even. He probably knows that trucking is like a dead song from back in the day. That's probably about the extent that's of like the David's. most popular one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I said your loss and that I did my best. But uh, they did have several quality shows from the old Knickerbocker Arena. I don't know if this building they're playing in is the Knickerbocker Arena, just renamed multiple times. I, I got a hunch they've built a new building in Albany. 
I'd hope so. Since uh, since back in the day. But anyway, we'll have a lot for you there. Uh, Indiana is one of the uh, few teams that has beaten South Carolina in recent years. That's one of the three losses since 2019. That's crazy, man. I had forgotten about that. And that was down in, like, the Virgin Islands or mm-hmm. Bahamas, somewhere down there. Um, I, so there's that. I don't think that really matters a whole lot. Yeah, 2019 was almost five years ago. Um, by the way, speaking of Carolina women's basketball, she's not a Gamecock yet, but a uh, huge congratulations to Camden's Joyce Edwards. If you have not yet heard now, she signed for the Gamecocks a few months back, but uh, she has been named the Gatorade National Player of the Year. Well done. Uh, that's we hard to do, Joyce. man. That's we hard to do. Joyce. It is. You know? Uh, uh, she plays volleyball and soccer as well. Uh, by all accounts, an amazing person too. I've not yet met her, uh, but uh, everybody that I have talked with, and I know a lot of people over in Camden that know a lot about her and her reputation, and uh, that Dawn is getting a good one in a lot of ways. So, but Gatorade National Player of the Year, man. So good for her. She'll be a Gamecock next season. But uh, looking forward to this, and certainly South Carolina is favored to win this tournament. Um, it'll be interesting. Now, now's where it gets. I don't want to say harder, right? Because South Carolina has gone on the conference road. And, you know, we that's one of the things that I have pushed back on so when people say, oh, it's a tournament environment. But it's really not. It's like, not. you know, again, when Carolina went to Baton Rouge or even last season when LSU came, those aren't tournament environments. Those are regular season environments. And there is a vast difference. Now, hostile environments. It's, 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 it's a tense environment. And I suppose that's what people are going for. And I don't mean to try to push back too hard because I know what they're going for, but I, I, I do not agree with that. Um, that's the beauty of the differences in what we, what we do in a regular season and in a tournament. And, of course, in the women's tournament, you are also playing uh, 16 schools, like just like in baseball, are playing for some form of home court advantage in the first couple of rounds. And South Carolina has been doing that for a long time, too. Um, so you can, in a tournament, have a hostile home environment, but only through those, you know, the round of 32. Now it, it's going to be a, a neutral court. And uh, I'll be curious to see exactly how neutral and or hostile it might be towards South Carolina. I do know that there's going there's a lot of fans that are going up there, which is good. We travel very well. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, this is where it gets different. That, that's what I'll say. Uh, does it get harder? It, you know, it depends on one's point of view. But you aren't in your friendly confines anymore, and you won't be again. And, and this is where Don will have the, the, the team really buckle down on their, on their defensive situation. And we, we saw that against North Carolina. Again, the defense was just incredibly impressive uh, against, against the Tar Heels the other day. And, and that's what's got to travel and continue from this point on. I mean, certainly you're, you're going to want to have, you know, a lot of scoring and, and, and great bench play, which you've been getting. But um, now it just gets, you know, different, different mm-hmm. and looking forward to it. But we'll, we'll talk to, to David and to Brad about that. Um, you know, beyond that, you don't, you don't change a whole lot of who you are and what you do, right? No, no, you shouldn't because what, that's what's got you here, right? I mean, you're going to have an athleticism advantage on every team you play. Yeah, for, uh, from here on out, even if you do end up, you know, getting a rematch against LSU, who I think in terms of uh, athleticism can can hang with you a little bit, but you're going to be deeper than every team you play. I don't see really a team in the country that has five girls to bring off the bench that can compete with your second five. You're going to have a lot of advantages. A lot of this is going to come down to execution of your stuff, right? I mean, right. Uh, you look at Indiana, you know, they, they play a lot through Mackenzie Holmes down low she's uh, a forward but she's only about six three camille is going to be guarding her and camille's got four inches on her uh, that that is going to be a really tough a really tough matchup for for indiana and if you're south carolina you just do what you've been doing all year you just got to be able to execute don't commit stupid turnovers which there have been times this year they have fallen into lulls <clears throat> the first quarter of texas a&m game and the sec quarterfinals where you turned over 10 times in a 10 minute stretch you just got to avoid the silly stuff, right? You avoid the silly stuff. You are so good on paper to where y- you can play your C minus game against Indiana and, and still win. It might be ugly, but a C minus game would, would, would still win it for you. Right. Uh, again, Carolina has Indiana tomorrow. They, uh, those two schools will know who their, uh, their Sunday opponent would be. Oregon State and Notre Dame will play tomorrow at 2.30. 
Um, it is interesting to me, too, and I, I noticed this when the tournament was seeded. You know, Connecticut's a three seed, but they're out in Portland. And I, I and UCLA My is call. a two seed that they sent to Albany on the other side of the bracket, I might add, not on Carolina's side. Again, Carolina, mm -hmm. should they beat Indiana, uh, will need to beat the winner of Oregon State, Notre Dame, and then you're in the Final Four. But uh, sending UCLA from California to uh, upstate New York and sending Connecticut to Portland, Oregon. So um, I do wonder what the thought process was in sending Connecticut out west other than maybe not wanting to, because it's close enough, certainly create any type of super advantage oh, for Connecticut. Oh, would be an advantage. Because there would have been. Oh, well, here's the thing, too. With with even teams like, you know, Connecticut and South Carolina now, I mean, your your fan base is pretty national. You're, you're a national brand. So I would, I'm not even going to be surprised to see, you know, in Portland, there be a large section of Connecticut fans there in attendance. But that's also a problem that the NCAA has with how they did their women's bracket with only having two sites right. for your, I guess, regional semis and final matchups. Whereas, you know, like in the men, there's four, right? Like you, you can either play in Boston, Detroit, Dallas, or Los Angeles. You're spread out literally through all four, almost all four time zones of the United States. Whereas here you are in the very far corner of the East Coast, the very far corner of, for, uh, corner of the West Coast, and... That makes some pretty difficult travel arrangements for some of these teams. Uh, we'll talk a lot of basketball again. David coming up at the bottom of the hour. Brad, the bottom of the 430. We've got some football to get to for you as well. Also today, even though the Braves aren't playing, uh, so that's all I really care about. But today is officially Major League Baseball's opening day. Yes, technically speaking, the Dodgers and Padres did play two real games over in Korea last week. Opening day in America. But today is opening day across the United States. And a few of the games in the Northeast Corridor have been rained out, including uh, the Braves game in Philadelphia. They'll start tomorrow. But I have asked this question today on Twitter uh, in honor of Major League Baseball opening day. When grilling hot dogs... And I'm being very specific to the hot dog. How do you like them cooked? Warmed through? B, a little char? C, well done and smoky? I'm going to let this run through tomorrow's program because tomorrow's when the Braves play, so I'll have a second opening day for me as a fan. May even bring in some hot dogs. I don't know. They don't let us grill here. I wish they did. Yeah, no open flames inside the building. Yeah, really. it's unfortunate. Even out, apparently, I've asked before, even apparently if we wanted to bring a grill and put it on the breezeway out there, uh, it would be frowned upon to disallow. Wow, I didn't know the No Fun League existed outside the NFL. If I were to be one that would ask for forgiveness instead of permission, how would that go? You know? <laughs> once, once I was asking for forgiveness... Because I don't think our company at that point would be the one to have a problem with me. Yeah, because it's the, the building that hosts a lot of other companies. In yeah. It. See, we're, we're, we're sharing space here. It's a big building. Lots of people. Yeah. Different companies. So warm through, a little char, well done and smoky to where it basically doesn't look like a hot dog anymore. Which one of those would you prefer? Uh, a lot of you have already voted. Thank you. I will give you some results in just a little bit. Uh, at J Phillips 10 at J Phillips 1075 if you'd like to participate uh, I want to get into a quick thing that Stuart Mandel of the athletic talked about um, this week when it comes to the expansion of the SEC or potential expansion give you a, what a national college football writers thoughts are on that one as we continue to look at Florida State Clemson North Carolina maybe some others you're listening to the post game show
20 minutes after 3 o'clock on this Thursday. Welcome back into the postgame show. Jay Phillips, Elijah Campbell with you. We'll talk more Carolina women's basketball with David Kloniger live from Albany in just a bit. And Brad Muller, the voice of Carolina women's basketball, joins us around 4.30. Tomorrow uh, at 4 o'clock, our good friend Mike Waddell, uh, former athletics director at Towson, former associate AD at Arkansas and Illinois, uh, also a former NASCAR exec, Uh, Now back in media up in North Carolina will be joining us. He was in the courtroom last week uh, for the FSU ACC hearing in Charlotte. And uh, there's new developments there because FSU has filed another complaint against the ACC. Uh, That happened yesterday. Um, It's interesting. And that leads us into this story now. But Mike will be with us tomorrow. So Stuart Mandel of the athletic was writing about you know, just you know i mean that's what he does college football and he was writing about potential expansion and scheduling in the southeastern conference and i want to read you something here about it, it ties into both i want to read this and 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 elijah see what you think and and those of you know there's there's a lot of belief let me preface it with this there's a lot of belief you know that, that as soon as clemson and florida state can get out of the acc bang they're into the sec and again that may be true although it's not necessarily what I've been hearing of late, but that's beside the point right now. Let me read this to you. Uh, Stewart writes, contrary to what many assume, I do not believe Sankey is actively looking to expand the SEC further. If anything, he may view the Big Ten's 18-team four-time zone monster as a cautionary tale, not to mention any viable candidates would come from the ACC, whose legal fights with Florida State and Clemson may take years to play out. The 2026 schedule will have to be determined no later than the end of 2025, roughly 20 months from now. I doubt the parties will even be through discovery. He means those involved in the ACC fight. He, Sankey, writes uh, Stewart, wants to needlessly expand the NCAA tournament much more than his own conference. But he, but he more than anyone else, wants them to go to nine games. So extending the current format by only one year allows them the flexibility to do so come 2026. Uh, there's a lot of things in there in, a, in, a, in just a couple of paragraphs. But the, the biggest one, uh, I'll say again, he, you know, I do not believe Sankey is actively looking to expand the SEC. He says later, Elijah, he wants to needlessly expand. Now, that's a little editorializing. Needlessly expand the NCAA tournament much more than his own conference. Also, from what I am gathering and the people I was speaking uh, speaking with, true. So, again, I, I've heard others on the national scene, most notably Andy Staples, say, oh, listen, you know, it, it's all about brand, and you got to grab them as soon as you can get an opportunity. I understand that point of view. Uh, Andy is also well-connected, so there may be things he's hearing. Um, Josh Pate has said something similar to what Staples has said. And yet I've got on the other side of it, if you will, from a national standpoint, and I would consider all these names that I'm giving right now national, uh, Stuart Mandel and Ross Dellinger say the opposite. Ah, SEC's not doing anything because they don't want to or need to. I don't know where the truth is. I don't think there can be any middle ground, though. Sometimes we can say the truth may lie in the middle. In this case, it really can't. Either you do expand again or you do not. Or you want something or you don't want something. Yeah, and I, I really don't think they want to. If anything, I think, they, I think he's right. I think they'd like to go to a bigger schedule of conference games to provide better inventory and, again, try and correct the problem of teams not seeing each other often enough. And, again coming back and and i need to go back and look you and i can do this this will be like our homework for some spring football carolina is not going to see georgia or florida or tennessee again in 2025 and that's not sitting well with carolina fans even if you might not be favored in any of those games uh who else is that happening to in terms of teams you've played for a generation that you won't see yeah I, i i don't know but you know, and again, if you could pick one, I'd pick, I'd pick Georgia, mm-hmm. um, even if beating Florida or Tennessee may be, uh, dare I say, easier, for lack of a better way to put it, in a short amount of time. So, but regardless, you know, who else is that happening to? But I, I, it's just interesting to hear sort of competing thoughts 
on where things stand with FSU, Clemson, potentially North Carolina. And again, I remain in, in the camp that of all those teams, North Carolina remains the biggest prize in the long term sense. Yeah, and because this is all viewed through television, and that's really it. Like, we, we went through the exercise last week, right? Is Virginia football a bigger brand than Clemson? No. no. Is it a bigger brand than Florida State football? No. Absolutely not. But when you're tra- when you're expanding, you're expanding into TV markets. Virginia is a is a big state, a lot of people in there, and there'd be a vested interest in the SEC if the SEC network were or the SEC were to take one of those teams, Virginia or Virginia Tech. I don't think it really matters. Right. Into your conference. Same thing with North Carolina. Like yes, you already have i guess the sec network in those markets but you will get vested interest and you like they, it, there's going to be a lot more to gain by getting a team into that market which is why clemson and florida state is just redundant which it, like here, so here's the thing stewart mentioned the big 10 maybe being a precautionary tale for other conferences looking to expand for just the sake of you know college athletics imperialism and that is because they're stretched across four time zones you're already going to spend a metric bleep ton of money to send your softball and soccer and yeah. even baseball teams, your non-revenue sports, right. uh, breaking news, also play in those conferences. You're going to have to send everyone, if you're UCLA, Southern Cal, Oregon, Washington, you're sending everybody four time zones away yeah. for road games in Piscataway, New Jersey, Columbus, Ohio, insert Big State College, here. College Park, and those teams are also going to California? Yeah. This is incredibly experimental. Yeah. I ensure Clemson and Florida State are in the footprint geographically, but they're having to spend a lot of money doing that while also cutting that pie 18 pieces. Yeah. They can have a larger lump sum on their TV contract. They can and still not make more per school than SEC schools will. That is a real factor because you know what these conferences are made up of? Schools yes. and member institutions. That's what that I try also to remind people. Yeah. Want more money, right. right? The SEC is run by its member organizations. Right. And if there's a way that they have to compete inside their own state and potentially make not as much money as they could without them, they're going to veto that so fast it'll make your head spin. Right. I, I, it, it, logic tells me they will not expand into at least Clemson and Florida State. What like logic that's, that's should why. do is is prevail here and again have should. Clemson and Florida State continue to work to to reorganize the structure of the Atlantic Coast Conference. There's still there's still potential there. Like, you know, that's I, the again, thing. Still. lobby the schools to to try and 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 write a new deal. Now, easier said than done. I, I get it. And like mm-hmm. I said too, I think I've said in the past, they may have already failed at that, and we just don't know it. In fact, chances are pretty good that they've. And when I say failed, I don't mean to like pick on them but i i would i would like to believe that their first thoughts were uh, any of y'all interested in try having a vote on blowing up the grant and then let's start over see what happens and there is you know we now do know that there is a little like look in next year for espn not the conference mm-hmm. and that espn could potentially and, di- I, and now i better say disney could potentially blow up the deal uh, and at that point whoa well, and here's the thing. There's a lot of schools in the ACC, like your Dukes, your Wake Forest, they have a vested interest in keeping this thing together because you know what no one wants to be? Washington State and Oregon. No, I, yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what well, we're going to be looking down the barrel of if this thing does blow up. And that's no, what you and I were saying, man. Like, And I, 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 this makes me almost a little sick to my stomach you know, to think about. But, like, Duke, Wake, Syracuse, Boston College, you, you need to be on the horn to the mm-hmm. Big East and just going, like, uh, just – Y'all don't forget. Now we can we can bring you some some good stuff. Contingency plan. Yeah. Hey, my you know Miami or Virginia Tech. Hey, remember that one time yeah, we were a part of yeah. your conference? I mean, Syracuse and BC have been a part of it, and and the B and 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 the Big East would would welcome with open arms Duke and Wake Louisville. Forest. Louisville. I mean, I don't know if it, I don't know if they'd re welcome Louisville or not. Maybe I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you, but but Duke and Wake Big East would be like, come on in, and y'all can be mm-hmm. football independents and have some fun with it. We'll talk to David Kloniger about what's going on in Albany as the Gamecocks get ready for Indiana. D.C. joins us when the postgame show continues.
Time to talk a little Carolina women's basketball with our good friend David Kloniger. He is on the scene in Albany where in, uh, let's see, 25 and a half hours. Oh, look at that. I did math. South Carolina and Indiana will tip off in the Sweet 16. Is it correct math? Uh, 20, yeah. Yeah. Well done. Right? I, I'm not good enough at it to be able to correct you. Am I right, David? In real time. That sounds right. Just say yes. Makes, <laughs> makes it easier for me. David, getting the calculator out. David, <laughs> David Kloniger joins us now. Uh, David also, by the way, instrumental in uh, getting the Braves uh, rain delay today so that he'd be even busier tomorrow covering the women's basketball game while the Braves are playing the Phillies. So well done, man. You, you carved out a lot for yourself. Well, what can I do, man? I'm going to miss the uh, last few innings of the Braves choking away an opening day win. Oh, so, God. you know, I went ahead and did myself that solid, so I don't have to watch that wretched bullpen come in and try to do anything. I won 104 uh, games last year, man. 104. Yeah, well, you, you know how many that, that means they could have won? I know. And you also have to announce how many did they win when it counted. When I don't counted. remember. Not enough. Exactly. So, you know, it's uh, – that's the whole point. Great season last year, bitter end. I say that a lot, but hey, we'll see what happens. I mean, at least I'll have a free afternoon today, and I won't have to worry about tying myself and not watching the Braves. So, you know, there was that. Uh, before we talk basketball real quick, I mean, Albany's like, what, about as big as Columbia, maybe even a little bigger. David, what is there, like, what's what do you do on an off day in a place like Albany, New York? Well, I mean, there's a lot, you know, uh, just, you know, I, I don't know if crammed is the right word, but there's, you know, a lot of storefronts like you'd expect to see in uh, New York, like New York City, uh, a lot of, you know, different restaurants, bars, taverns, uh, stores all around downtown. They do have a rather famous piece of architecture slash concert hall called the Egg, which is basically just a giant concrete egg. And it's, you know, based on another chunk of concrete rising up near the uh, tops of the rest of the city's architecture. And apparently they get some pretty good uh, acts in there because the acoustics yeah. are so remarkable. Right. So, uh, and yeah, you know, and the arena here isn't being used for basketball or Siena uh, basketball. Um, they have, a, you know, a indoor lacrosse. The Fire Wolves, I believe, are the team. And then, you know, some hockey and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, uh, you know, you can go out to the airport, mush the plane. <laughs> watch the trees not not sprout you know that's not terrible and no snow on the ground still right there's a little bit like in clumps but no nothing falling and the roads are clear right. so that's i good. can deal with snow as long as it's not sticking on the road that's good let's uh let's jump into this game tomorrow elijah and i were talking earlier indiana one of the last teams to beat south carolina in, in the last few seasons but it was a few years ago so uh no no real connection to to the team other than maybe the coaches but uh what does indiana present tomorrow in terms of how south carolina likes to play um you know tough shooting team i believe they're the top uh, team by field goal percentage in the ncaa uh they have a big girl in the middle uh, who's very very skilled at what she does she can score from the inside uh you know on her left and right hand on a post-up move uh, and, you know, they're, they're a tough team. You have, really have to guard for them one through five. But then again, they really haven't faced the kind of talent that South Carolina will bring at them. And I know some people say, well, what about Iowa? And I say, what about Iowa? Iowa is Caitlin and the Pips. I mean, the, the Pips are pretty good, but they're not Caitlin. And, you know, Iowa is basically a one-trick pony. So Indiana can get you if, if you allow them to hang around, but they're not terribly fast. They're not terribly, uh, you know, speedy or try to get you out of your set. Says we're going to do what we do, which is Midwestern plotting. Uh, you know, we're going to take our time and be deliberate and patient, and that plays right in the South Carolina fans of how they want to play. Because if there's a turnover, buddy, it ain't going to end up with anything but Gamecock points. So, uh, you know, it, it is tough. It's uh, as you mentioned, they are one of the few teams to beat South Carolina since 2020, but that was a long time ago, and only one player on. Uh, that team is still around. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. But uh, South Carolina was installed as a 15-and-a-half-point favorite. And uh, if I was a betting man, I might be taking the over. Mm. David, uh, one of my favorite things about this team this year is the way Coach Staley talks about how they play in games and how they practice. And you tweeted <laughs> about an hour ago that the first 30 minutes of practice today, very nice, very good, great mm -hmm. success. The last 30 not so much. Have you ever seen a team that's this dominant in games but also has a coach talk about how they practice the way Don does? 
not not as consistently throughout the season. You know, you figure if uh, if there was if there was a problem like that, they would get it figured out after the first half of the season. But really, no, nah, it's just there are moments where they practice real good, and sometimes they have a string of full uh, wire to wire great practices, and then there are others where they just don't. And but Dawn knows it's like well you know but they haven't let it affect them in games so it's uh, it's it's a, a bad connotation for the term but I really don't know another term to use which is unprofessional because it does have a negative connotation but in the, all that I mean when I apply it to this team is that last year's team was just so business like business as usual and this year's team is like we're going to do things our own way. And we're going to play loose, we're going to play fun, and it's going to be okay. So, And when you put it that way and say they're still 34-0, and 0, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that negative connotation. So it's a good thing to have, you know, because that's what they've done all year, and it works. So if you're not going to if – it, if it's working, you're not going to try to tinker with it too much. David Kloniker is in Albany covering the women's tournament. Uh, it's two regionals in one location, and that's where I want to take you next, D.C. Um, Carolina wouldn't see the teams I'm going to mention until the Final Four in Cleveland, but Iowa is in Albany. Colorado is there. LSU and UCLA are on the other side. Notre Dame is there a as a big brand, too. Give us an idea of what the traveling contingents are like. Well, I mean, I haven't seen too much of them just because I've been locked in the arena all day, but I do know – that uh, tomorrow, uh, Saturday's games that feature Iowa, that feature LSU, tickets are, you know, on the secondary markets are going through the roof hmm. right now for people who want to see LSU play, want to see Caitlin play. So it's, uh, it's big time, you know, and that's how they did the brackets. Uh, you knew that as good as the Pac-12 was going to be this year, that not all of them could go to Portland where the other regional is, and that, you know, most of the eastern teams or midwestern teams are probably going to be sent here too. So that's what ended up being. And, uh, you know, UConn got sent out west, which was quite a surprise to me. Right. But that's, of course, where the, the, the seed lines put them. So you look at it and say, okay, uh, you know, just how can you get somebody in here? And with the regional draw that they're going to have, Jay, um, they've got two more years of this arrangement where it's eight teams in two regionals, right? I think that they'll probably look at that when the time comes to re-up and say, yeah, we want to keep doing this because in the women's game, it's still very much about butts in the seats. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of butts in these seats in Albany the next couple of days. David, Jay and I were talking earlier uh, about, you know, maybe the road ahead, how hard it's going to get now that we're in the Sweet 16. And I, my thought initially is if they execute well, there's not a team in the, in the country that can beat them. But we talked about maybe some things that can trip them up might be the turnovers. And we alluded to the quarterfinal mm -hmm. against AM, and uh, where they turned the ball over 10 times in the first quarter. Is there a team left in this field that can maybe exploit that small weakness that this team has? Well, there's always going to be that thing if you if you play them that way. Now, is there one team that I look at and say, oh, man, you got to watch out for their defense? No. But there are a lot of teams that I look at and say, hey, can that team run a high pick and roll successfully? Yes. Ooh, USC might be in trouble because that's what gave them trouble last year. That's what gave them trouble this year, specifically in that game against Tennessee. Now, the good thing is they ain't going to have to see Rakia Jackson anymore. That's great, but there's a lot of other great players that they also might potentially have to see. So you do have to take it just one opponent at a time, and I can tell you this team isn't thinking about, okay, we're four wins away. They're not thinking about that at all. It's like, who's the next opponent? Indiana? Okay, let's go try to beat Indiana and then see where they are. Now, is there the underlying current of, man, 34-0, and 0, number one seed, and ain't nobody talking about them? Yeah, a little bit. But I can tell you that's mostly from the upper members of the team, some of the coaching staff, and it's a minor annoyance, not even an issue, because the team does not care. They really don't. It's just like, let's just go play. Let's just go win the next game. I mean, And they'll say, at the end of it, well, we'll see how we are. Maybe somebody will be talking about us then. Good stuff as always, man. Have fun up there. We will uh, check in real soon. Appreciate you. Uh, no problem, guys. Thanks for having me. That is our good friend David Kloniger in Albany, Carolina, and Indiana. Tomorrow at 5, we'll have Brad Muller in just a bit. More as the postgame show continues.
Welcome back in. Postgame show continues. Thanks to our good friend David Kloniger for joining us. We'll again have a lot more Carolina women's basketball talk with the voice of the team, our good friend Brad Muller. He will be joining us coming up at 4.30 today. Looking forward to doing that for you. Uh, thrown out a poll question today. Uh, in honor of Major League Baseball opening day, when grilling hot dogs, how do you like them cooked? A, warmed through. B, a little char. C, well done and smoky. Uh, right now, a little char is well out front at better than 75%. 75.7 to be precise. 18.9% of you say well done and smoky. Just 5.4% say warmed through. Steven even hit us on Twitter and said, why isn't there a category of out of the bag? Uh, Tom hit me. Uh, said slightly burnt on the grill. It is the way. Now, see, Tom, the picture you sent me, man. That's that. If that's like slightly burnt, I don't call that a little char. Tom's got a picture where they're pretty charred up, and that's kind of where I'm going with it. Now, I know people that like them like burned, almost on fire. I can't quite do that, uh, but I can come pretty close. And and just for the re regular hot dog. Now, if it's like a, a brat or some such, I like all these things on the grill. I don't mind them in the pan or whatever, but, you know, I'd rather put them on the grill. Although the hot dog roller at the convenience store is always a – I always kind of wanted one of those. I feel like that's a dangerous game. Could be. That's always a dangerous game. It's one that I'm not willing to play. I, I do consider myself a gambling man, but, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not gambling on that. In the sense that, that – you mean, like, from the convenience store that you should have yeah. one at your house? Uh, can, uh, on the roller? The convenience, convenience store, store. store. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, there's a couple of places, as long as you know that you're getting like the brand name dog, I'm good with that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. But in terms of how I like, like the hot dog, I got to see multiple grill marks. I don't want it all uh -huh. the way cooked through, but like a couple of grill marks yeah. is fine. I like to know that it was on a grill. But again, you and I were talking earlier in terms of, uh, you know, the, the sausage, whatever, whether it's a hot dog, which is technically a sausage or, you know, a smoked sausage or a brat. It's a lot of things, technically. Yeah. You know, a hot dog is not a sandwich. Don't give me that, please. I'm not that guy. I, I, I just don't even like that discussion. I don't even care. Tell me what to call it, and I'll call it that. I, I, it's not a sandwich. But, see, I don't want to even want to go there. I, I don't like the uh, I don't like the kinds of, of, like, sausages that they have the cheese included inside, you know? Yeah, overrated. Because I don't know what, I mean, I they're fine. is that good but, cheese? Like, I don't know. I, if I want some cheese on it, I don't, a cheese on a hot dog is not really my thing anyway. But occasionally, like some cheddar on like a, just a good old-fashioned chili dog, I'll do that. Dad, do you like, do you like a slaw dog? Like, like chili and slaw? I'm not, not a big slaw guy mm. at all. Um, or sauerkraut. We used to have a great place here in town, and I miss it so much. And those of you know, I'm getting ready to say here, but we had a place called Sandy's, and they had a bunch of locations. They just, I think after a while, the family just didn't want to, do it anymore i miss sandy's and there used to be one i'm pointing uh, just south of the state house that way that way uh and I, I missed that place when i was uh, a kid there was a smaller one that had an arcade and then they moved to an old hardy's behind the state house when i was in college and i'm not gonna lie i ate there about five times a month or more hmm. a lot i mean you, know, you get a big hot dog a bag of chips and like a Big Dr. Pepper, and back in the day, anyway, for like five bucks, it's pretty good for a college budget. That's really good for today. A it might budget. be more like 10 bucks, but you see the point. Yeah, but it was still really good, man. And you get like the Sandy's super chili, and that was I missed those. Not a big chili guy, and every once a in a while, like you get the melty cheese on top, just a like little splurge. Yeah, give a little texture. Somebody needs to tell me, too, where can I go get, like, a, a, a hot dog like that in Columbia anymore? I should know these things. I'm from here, but, I, I mean, I don't know anymore. I don't know where to go get a hot dog like that. See, I'm, I'm curious. I couldn't tell you. I haven't left you long enough to find that place, but I would be curious to know. Hit me up on Twitter, at jphillips107. Leave a reply to this question, please, and tell me where to go get a hot dog like that. So this is not just a poll. It's a hot dog recommendation thread. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, again, here's uh, how it looks for the NCAA Women's Tournament. Um, 
So on Carolina's side of the bracket, they're all playing tomorrow. Carolina, Indiana is the second game of the day, 5 o'clock. First is Oregon State, Notre Dame. And then out west, again, on Carolina's side of the bracket, you've got Texas and Gonzaga and NC State and Stanford. So that's what tomorrow uh, looks like for the women's Sweet 16. Get you into some uh, thoughts around what's going on with the men's Sweet 16, the EBPI is in full force and we'll talk to brad muller about what's going on in albany when the postgame show continues Pete Elwine Pool and Spa. I've been doing it for a long time. Says, Listen, you, you got the pool, you got the grill going with some hot dogs out there, man. You got yourself a good time. And you say, well, Jay, I've got a grill and I've got a backyard, but I don't have a pool yet. Well, then it is time for you to call the experts at Pete Elwine for years. They've been the Midlands leader in in-ground vinyl, fiberglass, or gun gunite swimming pool design and installation. It's a dream, right? Once it's done, though, man, upkeep, you need to make sure you're doing it right. Well, it's not just a, a job to build it for Pete Alewine. They will be with you the entire step of the way if you need them to be. They can come clean it for you. When things go uh, wrong, they can give you some quick repairs or upgrades. Whatever you need, they do it start to finish and beyond. And don't forget, Sundance hot tubs are part of what they do as well, the standard for hydrotherapy and deep tissue massage. Check them out at 5541 Sunset Boulevard in Lexington and always online at PeteAlwinePools.com. Like the two beverages, ale and wine. It's Pete Alewine Pool and Spa.
Four o'clock on this Thursday. Welcome back in. Second hour of the postgame show underway from the Herndon Chevy Studios in downtown Columbia, South Carolina. Alongside Elijah Campbell, I'm Jay Phillips. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks again to David Cloninger for joining us in the last half hour talking Carolina women's basketball and the scene around Albany. Because, uh, again, there's eight schools up there. It's not just one regional. It's two. Uh, again, Carolina will only see a, a portion of the bracket. Um, anybody else that's up there, they would not see until the final four. We'll go over the entire uh, situation for you again in just a bit. And again, get a lot more specifically on the Gamecocks from our good friend Brad Muller in just a bit. Uh, again, having some fun on baseball opening day, even though the Atlanta Braves, uh, which is who most people around here pull for, are not playing. The Braves-Phillies game has been rained out. Uh, they will play tomorrow instead. They were going to be, if you're saying, well, they, weren't they going to play tomorrow anyway? No. Uh, baseball likes to do this. Everybody has a weekend series. But what baseball tries to do is stagger opening day so there's more focus. So actually the Braves and Phillies were going to be off tomorrow um, and then play Saturday, Sunday. Now they'll just play your regular old Friday, Saturday, Sunday three-game set. Well, that's what they get for not scheduling a real true day game. Right. Uh, that's nationally televised. Well, if they had asked me, you know, I, I think every game on opening day should be at like one o'clock. Oh yeah, and have one nationally televised yeah. game at night. Yeah, that's fine. Like tonight, you got the Rangers as the world champion, the uh, World Series champion. I'm trying to avoid saying world champion anymore for that because they technically There's, don't play. Well, who won, who won the last World Baseball Classic? That's the world champion because it's an international competition. Yes. Yes. Yeah, like when somebody wins the World Cup, that's, you know, or if you win a gold medal in the Olympics, I will consider you a world champion, even though most sports have a world championship, which means the Olympics are even better. Like that episode of Seinfeld, you know, world's greatest dad, as opposed to just number one. <laughs> it's a larger, a larger candidate pool in world than just um, any. By the way, as we're going to talk about food, and thank you, uh, hot dog recommendations are are pouring in, and I'm yep. going to get to them in, in mere seconds. Um, have you seen – I have not even seen the trailer yet. I just saw a, 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 a blip go by on the Today Show this morning. But Jerry Seinfeld and Melissa McCarthy and many other comedy greats are uh, – a new movie is coming out. I think it's done and, and, and coming out soon. Um, and I guess it's a comedic, like, look – at the creation and uh, distribution originally of the Pop-Tart. And it actually, I saw a couple of things that look really, really funny. Um, I'm sold. But, I mean, Jerry Seinfeld, Melissa McCarthy, yeah, there's a whole host of people that look, I mean, it looks really, so I hope, and, and I saw like a ten, 10 seconds of the trailer is basically what I saw. But then I just heard Jerry Seinfeld, and I was like, and Melissa McCarthy, and I was like, all right, well, there's two comedic giants so that's all you had to hear yeah like um but then i saw other faces and i was like all right okay good so anyway there's that um so uh let me get to these all right um uh my very good friend uh i won't say lifelong friend but pretty close uh char hits me and she says freddy's has good hot dogs there is a fairly new place on gervais called rebel dogs haven't been there menu looks great well char people are backing you up um I got uh, two rebel dogs here, and uh, this, this guy says uh, Silver Fox Grill on Broad River in Irmo. Hmm. Jonathan uh, hits us and says, not necessarily Columbia proper, but Jimmy's Mart in Northeast Columbia is a great hot dog spot. For those just tuning in, uh, I, as a lifelong Colombian, uh, was lamenting the loss of all of our Sandy's hot dog restaurants. And at their peak, I want to say that there might have been at least a half dozen Sandys in the metro. But like I said, uh, there used to be one right on Sumter Street, right behind the Capitol, and then they that they, they outgrew it and moved into an old Hardee's behind the State House, a block over, uh, both of which I went to many, 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 many times in my youth. You estimate about five times a month at your point. On average, I mean, probably, because sometimes we might go like three times in a week, right? Yep. Then you might not go for a couple of weeks, but I mean, I, I, I was, I would say it was more than once a week for a few year period. Yeah. Because I might not always get a hot dog. They had milkshakes and ice cream. And oh, when yeah. I was a little kid, they had an arcade. And so I'm in there playing like, you know, Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, you know, cause I'm old Tron, uh, oh, yeah. centipede games of my 
you know, when I was a Ute. I just like going places to play. Because we could ride our bike, you know, because I, I grew up, my neighborhood, I lived over in Shandon, and we could just ride the bike, you know, up up here to, I mean, and nobody cared back then. Now I might get hit. But wasn't that hard more of a roll game. through five points and up, up Green Street and over to Sandy's. It was great. Um, anyway, so I miss Sandy's. But, okay, so I, I have heard good things uh, about Rebel Dogs, uh, which I guess is that way. And right down, I know where that is, down at the bottom of the Vista. I've, I've ridden by it, actually. So now I need to go try. I just, you know, a, a nice, big, fat, you know, better than just standard convenience store hot dog is what I'm looking for. We also got a call from our friend Jack. Um, said uh, Angelo's, either on Knox Abbott in West Columbia or okay. on Maine, was his favorite place to get a hot dog. Okay. He was, he sold me. He sold me pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's piqued my interest. I, uh, I mean, I need to do more of that. And look, there were some great places. There was a place. What was it called when I was a kid? Up near, up on at, at the lake. Go there with my granddad a bunch. Not too far from Yacht Cove. Some of y'all are going to scream at and remember the place. And it was just, you know, the old standard, it was the old standard, like, you know, convenience store hot dog. But I thought they were fantastic, man. You know, and they were like those pink ones, like the Red Hots and that. Oh, nice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just some kind of dye. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah. When you're a kid, you don't know that. You don't know any better. Yonces. Somebody hit me up and tell me if I'm right about that. Yonces. I want to say that was the name of the place. I, I, they had like this, the pullback thing to get in there and get the, the glass bottle of like, you know, Coke or Fanta orange or some such. Oh, nice. Yeah. But uh, I have asked today as well. The reason this came up, it is baseball opening day uh, in honor of opening day. When grilling hot dogs, how do you like them? A, warmed through. B, a little char. C, well done and smoky. Uh, a little char continues to gain over the other two now better than 76 percent last time it was a little over 75 so you as you keep voting a little char and that's where you are a that's little where char. i am yeah. i, I want to see multiple grill marks i think that's really my standard i got you. i'd like to see multiple. but you don't want it where like the hot dog begins to like flake almost with like ashy yeah black so that's too because it's just getting burned yeah that's like, too you much. don't want it burned yeah okay because I do know people that like it. I mean, they, they want some it people crispy. Do. Some, yeah, extra some people crispy, almost man. want a completely different color. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's that way. She would prefer a, a like, like if the ones that catch on fire, the, like at the back of the grill, you know? Like completely scorched. She'll just give me that one. I was like, all right. All you. Have she it. almost prefers it still on fire, yeah, actually. basically. No. Right. Like when you have a s'more and you have the marshmallow is on fire. It's still inflamed, yeah. yeah, when you're putting it. Yeah. Those are good. Oh, they're fantastic. Those are good. They're going to make me hungry. I yeah, we, we, not too really long, probably, we really probably ought to move on. Uh, tonight is the men's. We have to drool here. <laughs> I don't, we don't need that. And neither of us need that. The, uh, the men's uh, Sweet 16 begins tonight. And uh, the EBPI, that's the Elijah Basketball Percentage Index, has been in overdrive. Uh, yeah. Tonight's schedule is as follows. Clemson and Arizona will get it started out in L.A., uh, followed by... Uh, I say followed by. They're not followed by, actually. Uh, San Diego State and UConn will tip at 7.30. Uh, that is in Boston. Uh, game two in L.A. is Bama and North Carolina. Game two in Boston, Illinois and Iowa State. All of these, I think, are really good games. I realize Fantastic. that San Diego State and Clemson are the outliers in terms of uh, maybe seeds. Of course, San Diego State was in the title game last year. Um, Clemson has been playing fantastic basketball. Mm -hmm. This is Alabama's third Sweet 16 in the last four seasons. People just, yeah. you think football, 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 but Bama has spent money and Nate Oates has done a nice job. And that Illinois-Iowa State game from a national perspective may not have the brands because Clemson's playing Arizona, Connecticut is playing San Diego State. But the most competitive game of the night might be Illinois-Iowa State. Oh, that game's the best because you have two contrasting styles. Illinois, after their efficiency in the first two rounds of the tournament and their wins over Moorhead State and Duquesne, have vaulted to the number one spot in Ken Palm's offensive efficiency metric. Iowa State has leapfrogged Houston for the first time this year as the number one defensive efficiency team hmm. in college basketball. So per Ken Palm, you're going to watch the best offense in the country, square off against the best defense in the country. So if you want to watch just a great chess match, Iowa on offense, Iowa or not uh, Illinois on offense, Iowa State on defense. I want to come be fun. I want to come back to that one. Let me let me pick your brain here. We'll we'll kind of go two and two and let's let's take the ones where winners will meet. So let's start with Clemson, Arizona, then I want to mm -hmm. take you, Elijah, to 
to, to Bama and Chapel Hill. Um, we know what Arizona's about. And, again, we've seen Clemson playing some really good basketball the last couple of games. Give give them their due. Uh, what? Yeah, but Arizona's a, a pretty good favorite here, uh, six and a half points. What what does Clemson need to keep doing might be the, the first question I'd ask you. You're going to have to knock down some mid-range shots. I know the mid-range shot has kind of been the, uh, uh, the frowned upon shot in all of basketball here in the last few years when obviously it's not the most efficient. But here's the thing. Clemson can shoot relatively well from that range. And when you play a team like Arizona, who has a dominant big defensively in Omar Ballo, he doesn't like being on the perimeter. He doesn't like playing out there. P.J. Hall can play out there a little bit. P.J. Hall is going to have to be able to hit some jumpers, either in the mid-range or from three. And you're going to get that shot will be available all night long. If you can get Joseph Girard to hit one or two off the bounce, Chase Hunter, who's been fantastic in these first two games, to get him off the bounce and get him to some really comfortable spots on the floor, you're going to be able to contend because that's the shot that Arizona is going to give you. You know They're one of the highest percentage teams remaining in the field of 16 right now in terms of allowing other teams to shoot mid-range jumpers because they play so much drop coverage on ball screens. Right. Because when you have someone like Omar Ballo, you don't want him dancing around on the perimeter because he will get blown by every single time offensively you're going to have to be able to do that and you're going to have to concede offensive rebounds here like clemson's 221 in the country in offensive rebound percentage it's not their thing it's not going to have to be your thing tonight because arizona plays the eighth fastest offensive tempo uh-huh. in the country there's not, almost not a team better in terms of getting the ball off a miss getting into a transition offense and either shooting a three on the break or finding kashad johnson former san diego state player or pella larson or maybe some of the other slashing guards uh, for dunks and layups, almost 12% of Arizona's baskets are dunks. So the BPI, uh, 79.4% in favor of Arizona. That's 206 for Clemson. The EBPI says? It's going to say 64% Arizona Ooh. winning this game. Ooh. I see a pathway of Clemson being able to do it. And I will say out of all four games that are played tonight, Clemson, as the underdog, I say has the best chance. I know Illinois and Iowa State's going to be the best game, uh-huh. but I trust Iowa State's defense to really, really, I would say not just annoy, but overwhelm Illinois on that side of the floor, despite them being the number one offense in the country. If Illinois has a cold shooting night, Iowa State's going to cause turnovers. They have more. They have caused more 15 turnover games for opponents than almost anybody in the country. They will turn you over. It's not if, it's when. They will. So I can see Iowa State winning that game by even 10, 11, 12 points and being and looking really good doing that. Clemson might have the best chance of anybody in terms of pulling off an upset. I still don't think they do it, but I still give them about a 36% chance of doing it. The winner of that game gets the winner of Alabama and North Carolina. This one is a, is a lot more even. Uh, North Carolina is a four-and-a-half-point favorite, but the BPI here, 503 for the heels to 49.7 for Alabama. So this one's already basically at a 50-50 split despite the spread being bigger than the Illinois-Iowa State spread. The EBPI says what? North Carolina 75%. Oh, my. I think if these teams play four times, North Carolina's winning handily in three of them because North Carolina is a really good defensive team. Alabama is still an atrocious defensive team. Don't let wins against Grand Canyon and College of Charleston fool you. They're still not a good defensive team. Grand Canyon ran out of gas in the last five, six minutes of that game and was still on pace to put up about 80 points. But they end up playing at a pace they weren't comfortable with, which credit to Alabama for making them do. But College of Charleston, even though the game was about a 10-point game for a 10 to 15, 20-point game through its duration, still College of Charleston scored 96 points. Right. 96. That's what I wanted to say to you. Uh, okay, with the exception of Grand Canyon, I know I'm up, getting ready to get up against it. Um the other four of the last five opponents Alabama's played scored 96, 88, 88, and 87. The last five teams North Carolina has played, uh, they did lose to NC State. But uh, let's see, uh, 69, 62, 84 nice. state scored, 65, and 67. That makes your point. Yeah, North Carolina D's up really well. And I know the point spread's four and a half. I would take it at nine and a half. Oh, my. That's how good I feel about North Carolina winning right. this game. Those are the two games in L.A. We'll talk about the two games in Boston ahead of tonight's Sweet 16 as the postgame show continues.
a whole lot of hot dog talk on today's show, but I want to tell you about my friends at Underdog. That's right. Underdog Fantasy gives you another way to enjoy the tournament and some of the tournament games tonight with their Pick'em game. I love the Pick'em game because I can pick two to five players from multiple teams and build a Pick'em entry. And I'm telling you what, tonight I am really high on Marcus Damask from Illinois going higher on his turnover numbers. Iowa State causes more turnovers than almost any team in the country. I'm really liking that one. So you just do things like that. Take higher or lower on a lot of stat projections, and you can win up to 100 times your money in a single night. Here's all you got to do. Go to the Easy Use mobile app or underdogfantasy.com. Sign up with promo code 1075, and Underdog will match your first deposit up to 100 bucks. Plus, they'll give you a mystery special pick to use on your first pick and entry. Again, Underdog Fantasy, promo code 1075 to get your first deposit of $10 or more up to 100 matched. Must be 18 and present in state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play, call 1-800-GAMBLER or go to ncpgambling.org. Twenty minutes after four o'clock on this Thursday. Welcome back in, Jay and Elijah, with you talking Sweet Sixteen. The women get going tomorrow, and we'll have Brad Muller uh, from Albany in just a few minutes with more on Carolina and Indiana. Men start tonight again. Clemson will get it started against Arizona. That's uh, the first game that tips about thirty minutes later. That one, by the way, the Clemson Arizona game is in L.A. 
Uh, Boston is hosting Connecticut and San Diego State. That one is uh, about uh, 7.39 officially, they tell me. Bama and North Carolina will follow the Clemson-Arizona game. Uh, and again, those winners see each other. And then Illinois and Iowa State will uh, finish up in Boston. That game is scheduled to tip at 10 o'clock Eastern time. Time so, to brew some coffee. So, somebody needs to tell me why that's a good idea. Oh, Chris Mad Dog Russo already had a nice uh, rant on it. That's, that's, that's just, that's just, it's, it's terrible. It, it's really, and I, I hate sounding like old dude, but that's terrible. It's past your bedtime. And well, it's just past a lot of bedtimes. <laughs> Especially when the game's not going to end till after midnight on the East Coast. That should, I mean, don't. Why are you? Why are you tipping a game in the East Coast at t- scheduled for ten oh nine? It won't tip at ten oh nine. There's no way. That's that's just that's. I'm sorry. Heaven that's, forbid one go to overtime. That's stupid. Um, yeah. I, I just did. If you want to start the L.A. game at ten oh nine Eastern, that's great because I'm fine. I'm fine with a ten oh nine Eastern time tip, but not when it's in the East. Yeah, Again, the L.A. game, that, if you tip that at 7 o'clock in, in L.A., cool. Then the team, it's good for the teams. You don't want these kids. It's just it's – just. One thing I'd really like for them to – like not – I'm somewhat cool with staggered start times, but I would love to be able to watch all of them individually. Start yeah. one at like 5. There's no – there's no re- you're doing it You're doing it for the women. Yeah. Why can't you do it for the men? I, well, here's – but here's the thing. You can. They just don't. Dumb. I, I, it's just, I mean, that's dumb. I mean, you should start one. One should be starting right around now. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, start that. Start the San Diego State-UConn game, you know, at 5 in in Boston, Massachusetts. You know, I, I, it's just, anyway, I, I don't want to go on too much of a rant, but that's just dumb. But we'll talk about those in just a second. Um, Andy hits me, uh, my good friend Andy Folsom, and says, uh, Crave on Millwood has uh, great hot dogs. All right. I didn't, I, really I know familiar. where. That's that's right near where I live. Um, Kevin Millwood? Not Kevin Millwood. No, he's not playing anymore. Although he may have enough money to make good hot dogs. I'm sure he does. He made I a lot of money. I hope so. He made a lot of money. Um, Crave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I got one more here on hot dogs. Chuck says, uh, yeah, you know, Chuck, I've had the, the other store. The other store, um, it's near... Uh, it's right off Forest Drive in Forest Acres. It's called The Other Store. It's Church. called TOS, The Other Store. Huh. Uh, and it's sort of a convenience store slash small grocery store. It's been around forever. Great little place. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And I have had their hot but I bet you it's been, I don't know, man. I bet you it's been 30 years since I've had a hot dog from there. But they've been around a long time. That place is like a, it's like a neighborhood institution over in that, that part of town. So there mm-hmm. you go. And, um, all right, see, this is where my, my heart hurts a little bit. Um, John Whittle's mad at me. Uh, he says to me, if you can fix the world championship thing, because we were talking about, like, titles of things. What you can label yeah, a world I, champion. I said, I said the Texas champion. Rangers are the world champions, and I pulled back and said they're the world series champions. And world series is also trademark, too. You should probably. Whoever won the, the world, world baseball classic is the world champion. Uh, but John says, if you can fix the world championship thing, you can fix calling the NCAA baseball tournament the playoffs. John doesn't like that, that I do that. And, and uh, Coach Kingston does not like that I do that. You call it the playoffs? I, I just, I can't help it, man, because it's baseball and baseball has playoffs. I do. I, I, I interchange the two a lot. I, I freely admit that. Did you call the NCAA basketball tournament? No, playoffs? because there's this because it's not. You know, I could. I, I I could. You you can. And it would feel gross. You can. I mean, is, are the NFL playoffs a tournament? It is. Yeah. So I mean, again, they're interchangeable words. The difference is that with the with the baseball tournament, like there's a bunch of games and it's playoffs. Like baseball has playoffs. Playoffs. Yeah, I've always just called them regionals or super regionals. I, I, I interchange a lot of the words, but I, I do freely admit that I do often call the 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 college baseball tournament the playoffs. I'm because, with John. That feels wrong. Well, and and Mark Mark also and Mark Mark, Mark last year he, he was like, well, let me you know something about hey coach you know you're getting ready for the playoffs or something. He's like, well, first let me remind you it's a tournament. And I was like, eh, you know, if you beat a team you move on, and if you lose you don't, and that's what playoffs are too. 
Yeah, they're all tournaments. Right? Life is a tournament. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. Thank you all uh, for the hot dog suggestions. And uh, I've, I've let John whittle down, and that just, that's, that's, that's not good. It's like when a parent tells you they're not, not mad, good, they're man. disappointed. I mean, I'm older than John, but I feel like John, I just got, you know, John. He's not mad. He's no, just disappointed. He's not. He is. He's disappointed in me, and that's not good. And that's worse. Yeah, it is. I don't like that because John Whittle is one of my favorite people. So I, I, I've let John Whittle down. He is disappointed. <sighs> I'll try. I will do my best. I make no guarantees. Uh, before we talk to Brad real quick, the EBPI, again, working overtime on the uh, Sweet 16. So we'll have to go through these a little quicker. Uh, Connecticut and San Diego State in Boston at 739. Connecticut is the, uh, oh, they're the overall favorite. And the BPI. Does not like the Aztecs in this one. 86.6% wow. in favor of UConn. The EBPI says... Is going to take it a step further and go 90. Oh, my. UConn is the best team in basketball right now. I, th I thought the only team that would trip them up in that region is Auburn. Yeah. Because of their probably the most well-rounded team that UConn would face. They would see them if they win, right, Auburn? Or yeah. Oh, they, 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 would have, they would have seen them tonight if that were the, yeah. the case. If so, they didn't lose you know, to Yale. But before wait, Auburn lost? Yeah, it was oh. so long ago now, yeah. I didn't realize that. Oh, crazy. You sure? To Yale. Oh, man. I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, very odd. The nerds beat I kid, Auburn. I kid because I care. But, uh, yeah, so if you would have told me before the tournament that Auburn would get bounced in the first round, you made me pick a tournament champion, I would say UConn. That's how good this team is. They're the best team in basketball. No one runs better off-ball actions than UConn, and while San Diego State has one of the best three-point defenses, it doesn't matter when UConn can do what they did to Northwestern and that shoot 81% on twos. Oh, my. 81. I did not stutter. 81%. Yeah, they are really, really, really strong and very well coached. Best cutting team. To boot. Uh, then uh, that winner, which Elijah says is most assuredly Connecticut, will get the winner of Iowa State and Illinois. Uh, Iowa State a one-and-a-half-point favorite, but the BPI a little kinder to them, 58.1% to Brad Underwood's uh, Illini at 41.9. What say you? Well, 65. For Iowa for State? For Iowa State. Okay. Yes. I, I'm a big fan of this Iowa State team. Illinois, here's the thing. When you look at the two weaknesses, Illinois' defense, Iowa State's offense, I definitely trust Iowa State to be able to get buckets against Illinois' defense, which is Alabama-esque in terms of just being optional. And Iowa State's got a couple dudes in, in Tame and Lipsy and Kashawn Gilbert who are really good at getting theirs off the bounce. And they have a forward named Milan Momsilovic, who was a Kentucky target uh, from Milwaukee. Kid has a little Dirk Nowitzki in him a little bit. I'm not nice. just saying that because he's a European kid. Gotcha. But he's got a mean fadeaway jumper, plays really good on one-on-ones. I just I think this will be lower scoring than people think, and I think Iowa State's going to be able to get enough buckets to end up moving on uh over under in this one is 147 and a half so you're gonna go under i'll go under okay yeah, i'll go under okay there iowa state's gonna make illinois really uncomfortable uh and i've got competing lines at the same website uh, one says one and a half uh but i think the more recent one might actually be that iowa state is now a two and a half point favorite in this game uh, which which may jive more with your bpi i would take the side the ones. ebpi yeah. all right and again that one's scheduled to tip at 1009 eastern in an Eastern time zone venue. Sounds like I'm going to be shotgunning some Mountain Dews for this one. <sighs> it's just so Get dumb. amped. Stay up late. I'm, I, I, you know, at least I'm those two. watch this in my jammies. I'm at least excited. those two schools' fan bases, primarily, since they won't be there, are in the central time zone. So that helps them a little. The Lord's time zone. A little. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll come back around to the Women's Sweet 16. Get you more, uh, more, more prepared for Carolina and Indiana tomorrow. The voice of Carolina women's basketball, Brad Muller, on the other side of the break. If you are in the HVAC industry and you believe you're amongst the best of the best, then AAA Heating and Air is looking for you. They're offering a career with unbeatable benefits and compensation packages tailored to you. 
like, you know, the highest hourly rates in the industry, flexibility to choose a compensation package of hourly pay or salary or commission or a combination of all of them. Now, how about that? That's not all. As part of AAA's family, you could enjoy perks like two weeks paid vacation, comprehensive insurance coverage, 401k plan, and so much more, including a company vehicle, tablet, and phone. Need to stay connected? Listen, they're going to take care of you at AAA Heating and Air. If you're ready to join a team that values your skills and rewards your hard work, then call 803-677-1500 or log on to call AAAToday.com. Roy and Dana have a terrific team. You'll love working with them. If that's what you're looking for, they're looking for you at AAA Heating and Air. From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell with a few accidents to report to you. That might be causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. We'll start here in the Irmo Chapin area. A disabled vehicle has the right lane completely blocked on I-26 westbound right after the Broad River Road exit. Exit 97, again, a disabled vehicle has the right lane completely blocked on 26 westbound just after the Broad River Road exit. In Columbia, an accident on Bluff Road near Highway 48 at Berea Road. And on Bluff Road near Idlewild Boulevard, multiple accidents there have been reported. So traffic's moving pretty slowly over there near Bluff Road. And then one on Highway 262 near Lower Richland Boulevard is causing some delays, as well as one on Timbercrest Drive near Summit Parkway. Talking Sweet 16, men's starts tonight, the women tomorrow, the EBPI in full effect. We'll even get Elijah's take on what's going on around the women's tournament. But right now, we turn our attention back to Albany, New York, where our good friend Brad Muller is, Carolina and Indiana, tomorrow at 5 o'clock in the second of four Sweet 16 games on the women's side of things. How are you, sir? How's the excitement level building? 
Oh, it's great. You know, once every time you get to this point in the season, you know, the expectations get higher because you, you start thinking ahead of what could be. And, you know, in the women's tournament, this is where it really gets good because, you know, for the most part, uh, most years, you know, the teams that are supposed to win get to the Sweet 16. So there's not a lot of Cinderella runs that are going to end, you know, here. It, you've got good against good, and that's, that's what makes it a lot of fun. You know, one of the things I just told Elijah, and to, to further that point that you just made, Brad, I said it doesn't necessarily – necessarily maybe get harder South Carolina gets tested a lot in, in the non-con and in the conference schedule uh, but it gets different um, it, kind of take us through that you've done a lot of this now this is Carolina's 10th straight trip to the Sweet 16 so this has become when I say commonplace it's also become expected but it is difficult to get there but what what do you see as the biggest difference going into this round well, you know, the, the biggest difference when you get to this round is when you're at where South Carolina has been in, in recent years uh, is there's a little bit of that, you know, hesitation of you realize, yeah, there, there's teams that you're going to see that are really good enough to beat you. You kind of know, you know, when, when with what South Carolina has done, you know you're going to take care of business in round one. In round two, occasionally you get an opponent that's, that can be stiff, uh, you know, we thought North Carolina was going to be a tough task because they, the way they played us in regular season, it turned out to be a, you know an easy win for South Carolina because they played so well. But again, when you get to this point, you're playing a team. Uh, you're usually going to play a team that's ranked in the top 15 or so uh, in the country, and that that's where you're at. So um, you know, it used to be you know more than 10 years ago, you were excited just to get to that point, um, to get to this point where you are right now. But now the expectation is higher, so there's that little bit of pressure of you know you don't want it to end here. Uh, you know, you've had a good run, you've had a great season, but if if you don't keep winning, you know, people are going to think about the one loss as opposed to all the wins. And so you, you don't want that to happen here. Um, and you play a team that, you know, you're not that familiar with, that you've only seen uh, once in the Don Staley era. So um, it, it's, it's different and it's fun at the same time. But uh, it, it's fun because the teams that are supposed to be here are here. Mm -hmm. And this Indiana team, uh, no slouch. We were talking, you know, off air about – how they are the best shooting team in the country in terms of field goal percentage and number three, three-point shooting team as a team. I mean, the Hoosiers almost make 40% of their threes. They can shoot lights out at times. And when you look at how this Gamecock team plays defense, what do you think the number one thing is going to have to be in terms of making Indiana uncomfortable and making some of the shots that they take, which are usually pretty good shots, to be bad shots? You know, you, you got to come off screens and you got to be able to contest the, the shots. You know, you we saw that when this team played Utah, which had a ton of uh, three-point shooters, including their bigs. Uh, Utah had a big that could shoot threes. Uh, this is similar. It's almost like a four-guard lineup uh, with with a big who can do a lot of different things. You know, they're big. Mackenzie Holmes scores 20 points a game. Uh, you know, she would get a lot more attention if she wasn't in the Big Ten because she's second in the league in scoring to you know who, Caitlin Clark. But she's still averaging 20 points a game. Then you take their four guards. They're big guards. Uh, you know, they, they've got a six-three guard, a six-two guard, but they can they can drive to the basket. But between the, the four uh, guards out there, I think they've combined for almost 250 made three pointers. They they can shoot and make a lot of them in addition to to driving to the basket. So um, you can't you, you you've got to be careful coming off of screens. You've got to be able to get them at least get a hand in their face. And, you know, expect that they, they can also drive to the basket, but you, you've, you can't just give them practice shots. If you, if you allow them to, uh, to get wide open looks, they're going to knock them down because uh, uh, you've got people like Sarah Scalia, who's, uh, she's their Tina Pow Pow, so to speak. She's second in the Big Ten in three-point percentage and three-pointers made. She's made more than 100 three-pointers. Uh, she's shooting about 43%. Uh, most of their guards that, that play a lot are shooting in the 40% range uh, from behind the arc. So it's not like you just have to lock in on that one perimeter shooter and like, all right, just make sure we have a hand in her face because they've got three or four that can really knock it down, and I think that's the challenge. You know, the game contra are used to playing man-to-man -man defense but you've got to be really up, you know, up in their grill to make sure they're not getting good looks at the basket because they have there's not just one person you have to stop. They got a lot that can knock them down. Let's stay with that, Brad, because the defensive performance against North Carolina on Sunday afternoon was extraordinary. Less than 24 percent shooting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coach Staley was asked if that maybe that first 20 minutes, especially, you know, was their best 20 minutes of basketball all season. And I'm sure that there's a case to be made for that. And you would know as well as anyone. But when you saw that ferocity on defense, tell us, you know, how much of the message now becomes 
all about that at, at this point? And, and would you say that that from the last game that you just saw that that Carolina is beginning to peak on both ends of the floor? We, you're hoping that's the case. You're hoping that can carry over for exactly what you said for what they did on both ends of the floor. Obviously, the shooting was fantastic. When you when you score 56 points and a half against a quality team, you, you know you're doing something right on offense. But you're right. The defense, you want to see the intensity uh, out there. And that, that's something that kind of been a characteristic of this team the last few years is that they do take pride in their defense in saying, you know, how many points, because they play a lot of man-to-man, you know, the players were always competitive with, how many points the, the person they're guarding got. You know, it, it was a sense of pride if they kept someone to single digits or below their, their average, and, and that's what you want to see. And, you know, I think, you know, going into the North Carolina game, there was there was a little bit of a chip on the shoulder uh, for South Carolina, um, you know, maybe uh, from what maybe they had heard some of the North Carolina players saying they were going to try to do in that game, and you, you kind of hope that they, they're going to come out and play with that chip on their shoulder uh, here against an, an Indiana team. But you just want to see that same sense of pride and defense that you're not going to let you're not going to be the one that lets their your man, you know, shoot their average. If you know, if someone scores a bunch of points, it's because because they're going to be a high volume shooter. You know, if if they're going to score, let's say, ten points, you want to make sure it's because they took more than twenty shots, as opposed to taking just you know twelve shots or whatever like that. So you want to make sure if if they're scoring, it's, it's because they're they're taking you know, high volume shots, but not a great percentage. I, I don't ask this to, to like pick on North Carolina, I promise, but give us a courtside point of view of their body language as, as South Carolina was just pummeling them in the first half. Oh, I, you knew it was over. I mean, you you could see, and, and that's, and again, that's a good team. Their starting five are, are, are really good. South Carolina made them look not good. Uh, but and but South Carolina was hitting on all cylinders on offense, and it, it was so deflating that you know the Gamecocks would go on a big run, and then North Carolina might get a bucket, you know, or maybe two buckets in a row, and they're thinking, okay, we're back in this, and then boom, South Carolina's going on another 11-0 run, and they just knew they weren't coming back. You you could you can see the shoulders dip, and when you really see the shoulders dip is when South Carolina goes to their bench and there's no drop off. And you know we've talked about that all season long. In the first two uh, NCAA tournament games, the Gamecocks have used different lineups than they've used most of the year. One because of injury, and one because of you know Camilla uh, having to sit out the first game. So they've used different starting lineups, and there was no drop off with that new lineup or whoever came off the bench that day. You know you had some kids that. Uh, had been starters most of the year. They've been coming off the bench, and they're not pouting about it. They're they're being you know even more productive. But it, it, I think that's so deflating to teams that don't have that can't go nine or ten deep like South Carolina can. Um, that you know starting lineup comes out and punches you in the mouth and, and say, oh good, they're going to their bench now for a couple minutes, and then that you know bench starts another 11-0 run. You, you can just see the, the energy drain out of teams when they realize you know they, they can't match that because they don't have the bodies. And so that's what you hope for is, you know, if South Carolina uh, doesn't get into foul trouble, that they can just keep coming at you wave after wave. And if they can keep doing that, uh, you know, they, it's going to be a long day for a lot of teams. Uh, Brad, we're up against it, but can I, can uh, Elijah and I ask you to hold over? Cause I got a couple more things I want to get to yeah. before we let you go. All right. Good deal. All right. The voice Absolutely. of uh, Carolina women's basketball, Brad Muller joining us from Albany again, about 24 hours away from Carolina and Indiana. You're listening to the Thursday post game show.
Welcome back into the postgame show on this Thursday. Jay and Elijah with you. Our good friend Brad Muller, kind enough to hang over for a segment. He is, of course, in Albany, New York, where Carolina and Indiana will do battle in the Sweet 16 tomorrow. And we've been talking a lot about uh, what Brad is looking at from a scouting perspective. Elijah's got a few more questions as well. Yeah, I got a big one, Brad. And that was, you know, last year going into the tournament, I think we could all identify what the Gamecocks' fatal flaw could be were it to be exploited. And that was outside shooting. And clearly, not an issue this year um, being the number two three-point shooting team in the country by a percentage is there something that this team has I mean it can be hard to identify sometimes when you're beating teams by the margin that they are but is there something that you've been able to identify that could be a similar flaw that other teams are looking at South Carolina and thinking they might be able to exploit well you know I I I, I think with anyone, it's you know if you have that off night, of course, when you know when the when the cylinder gets tight on you and you can't do that. But now you're you're right. Last year it was okay. You didn't have as many threats uh, from the outside consistently, so you kind of knew you know you were going to pack it in and take your chances uh, on South Carolina not hitting from the outside. From that standpoint, you don't have that this year. You know South Carolina has inside outside uh, depth. You know things like that. Uh, I, I I don't see the the overt weakness that you saw. I don't know if that even if that's the right word that that you saw last year. It's just a matter of if if they're not locked in, if they're not in, you know uh, on top of their game. Um, you know, South Carolina's got the athletes, they've got the bench and depth. You know, on paper they've got everything they need. It's just a matter of you know executing and running their assignments uh, on defense. You know, the the one. You know, this, I think something that and, and it drives Coach Daly crazy all year is that this team does not practice like it plays, meaning they play pretty good on Thursdays and Sundays, you know, when most of their games are, but they don't always have great practices. And I know that drives her, her crazy as she would like to see, you know, be, better practices, but for whatever reason, it's worked. Uh, so, you know, to me, that's the only thing that, that you know, sometimes is a weakness is that, uh, you know, you're not sure what you're getting coming out of practice, but you go into the game and things seem to run smooth. But the, sometimes the practice sessions aren't as good as you, as you would like. Brad, before we get you out of here, uh, a note away from this current team, but someone who will be making an impact, we would think, uh, much like Malaysia Fulwiley did this year as a freshman, Joyce Edwards of Camden uh, named the 23-24 Gatorade National Player of the Year. Uh, a tremendous honor for any young woman that gets that wherever they are in the country. Here's another one that's going to uh, have done that and come play for the Gamecocks. What 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 have you already learned about Joyce and uh, you know what kind of player she's going to be in terms of impacting Carolina basketball? Well, the big thing, you know, obviously size is, is the big thing, and with uh, you know the likelihood of Camila Cardoso, you know, playing professional basketball uh, next year, good to have some more size in there and. Uh, it certainly adds to the depth. Who knows what the starting lineup's going to look like next year, but South Carolina not losing a lot. Um, but just great that someone like that can come in and doesn't have to be the star. And I think that's what's going to be great for uh, for someone like her, for Joyce, is the fact that she can come here and she doesn't have to be the star. She can kind of acclimate, similar to Malaysia Fulwiley this year, similar to Asia Wel Wilson her freshman year. You know, Asia was the national player of the year, and she came off the bench that year, you know, <laughs> because right. the, the starting lineup was that good. Um, you know, her and Elena Coates used to come off the bench, and you talk about shoulder shrugging when those two came off the, bu the bench. It was like, oh, man, now we're really going to get it. And so I, I think it, it's a great situation for everybody because she's obviously a super talent. Um, she'll, you know, have to learn to, to play at this level and speed of the game and all that, all that good stuff. But obviously she is someone that can come in uh, and contribute right away, whether it's as a starter or uh, coming off the bench. But again, she has the, the nice luxury of knowing she doesn't have to be the superstar because of what South Carolina should have coming back that, you know, if she accepts her certain role, whatever coach thinks she can do well immediately, just do that. <laughs> and then we'll work on the other stuff later. So, I, you know, it's going to be a great situation for her. you got Adele Tack as well, uh, who's coming off an injury, who enrolled early, that's yeah. been traveling with the team that gives you more size as well. And they got another McDonald's All-American guard coming in. And we'll see what else comes, you know, comes across after that. But, uh, you know, it, I'm just excited because you have a, a great player like Joyce that's coming in that, doesn't have to be a star right away and I think it's great you know I'm sure she wants to be I'm sure you know if she's good enough to start she will but I think it's great that she can come into a situation where hey you know what it's not all on you and I think it's, it's going to be a great role where she can come in and 
uh, you know, hopefully help this team to, to more championship runs. Yeah, and, and another testament, Brad, you, you mentioned some of the names already. And look, Don can recruit nationally and, and, and internationally. We know that. But if you mentioned Elena, uh, Asia, uh, you know, we know we know Tiff Mitchell was from right up the road in Charlotte. I yep. mean, right now you've got you've got Ashlyn in Malaysia from Columbia. Here's here's somebody from Camden. It, it, it's it's a real testament to basketball in this area. Yeah, it, it's great when you can keep when you have that much talent in a state population wise that is very small, and you can keep them. You know, you can keep the, all the kids in your backyard staying at your own house, and it's it's awesome. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun, and obviously that helps the fan base too because yeah. you know everybody gets engaged. You know, now I'm sure we're gonna have a lot more fans from Camden coming to games next year, so it's gonna be great. Hey, good stuff as always, man. Safe travels back home. Enjoy the weekend again. Carolina and Indiana tomorrow. That game tips at five o'clock. Brad will be on the call on. WOMG at 4.30, and uh, looking forward to a big weekend for Carolina Hoops. We'll talk soon, man. We always appreciate you. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. You bet. That is our good friend Brad Muller in Albany, New York. Again, four games up there tomorrow. Uh, Carolina will get the winner tomorrow, by the way, if you uh, don't already know, uh, the winner of Oregon State, Notre Dame, should they beat Indiana. So that's how that one matches up. you got to beat Indiana first, obviously. And actually, Oregon State, Notre Dame will tip before the Gamecocks and the Hoosiers. Headlines of the day. Some Gamecock spring football sound to get to. Drive around the SEC and a big day in men's basketball history. We'll give, give you all of that in the final hour of the postgame show.
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell with a few accidents to report to you, though, causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. And we're going to start here in Richland County. A disabled vehicle has the right lane completely blocked on I-26 eastbound right after the Columbia Avenue exit, exit 91. Again, the right lane on 26 east completely blocked right around the Columbia Avenue exit, exit 91 due to a disabled vehicle. Here in town, we also have an accident reported at Bluff Road and Highway 48 near Idlewild Boulevard. That one's had some delays caused for a while. Another one on Clemson Road at Hard Scrabble Road, one on I-20 westbound at Wilson Boulevard near Exit 71, one on I-26 eastbound at I-20 near Exit 107B. It is 5 o'clock news time on this Thursday, the final hour of the postgame show. Welcome back in. He's Elijah Campbell. I'm Jay Phillips. Let's start with Carolina baseball. Gamecocks in Tuscaloosa tonight for the first of three. Uh, this one is a, a big deal for South Carolina in terms of, of what they're looking at when it comes to uh, you know, kind of setting the pace in the first third of the season. After a sweep of Vanderbilt, in my opinion, you, you don't want to – let off the gas. Uh, South Carolina will go into a place where I think expectations were higher going into the conference season. It had been tempered a little bit because Alabama just got swept. Um, tonight, the game will start at 8 o'clock. We'll have it for you beginning at 745. Tomorrow, they'll play at 7. Um, and again, tomorrow night, just let me go ahead and say this, and we'll be saying it a bunch, uh, Carolina women's basketball tomorrow will air on our sister station, 98.5 FM, WOMG. That'll be at 4.30. And baseball will air here on the FM tomorrow on, on uh, 107.5 and across the network at uh, 6.45. So I do want everybody to have that programming note. So locally here in Columbia, women's basketball, uh, as is often the case, on 98.5 FM. If you uh, are not going to be near a television, then we'd love to have you tune in to Brad at 4.30, 98.5 FM. Um, uh, again, for tonight, though, uh, South Carolina will send Eli Jones to the hill. The junior is 2-0 and with a 2-3-5. He was brilliant against Vanderbilt the other day. Took a perfect game through six. Uh, 30 and two-thirds innings pitch, seven walks, 23 strikeouts. He will go up against freshman left-hander Zane Adams of the Tide, who is 2 and 2-1 with a 4-2-6 in 19 innings pitch, seven walks, and 12 strikeouts, um, 4 2 6 ERA, Elijah, uh, for a, a team like South Carolina that is scoring runs in bunches um, is probably going to have them licking their chops. And he's also a guy who doesn't strike you out a lot, which means South Carolina should expect to put the ball in play. I'm not predicting anything because I don't do that, but I, I like this pitching matchup, and I like where Carolina's bats are at this point. So you're saying the JBPI, the J <laughs> Baseball Power Index. I don't. I wish they did one of those for baseball so I could at least judge it. I, I would favor South Carolina in this. I, I favor South Carolina to, uh, to win this series uh, primarily because of the pitching matchups. Again, I'm not sitting here dogging Alabama, but like tomorrow – Listen, Dylan Eskew didn't. He had a, he was he wasn't terrible the other day. It, you know, he got pulled early because he just he was losing his control. It's um, preemptive. The, yeah, the pulling. But, yeah, but he but Vanderbilt wasn't beating him up or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, he just he had a few walks and a couple of HBPs, and I think Mark and Matt just saw. All right, you know what? Let's not let this get out of hand. And 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 Good came in, and I, I thought had a had a nice outing for him. But Ben Hess goes tomorrow. His ERA is over five. Now, uh, they've got a kid on Saturday, Greg Ferrone, a senior lefty who's doing a lot better. His ERA is under two and a half. So that one could be interesting. Uh, Pitzer, of course, in, in, in a few innings of work, has an ERA under a half. <laughs> so there's that. But I do like the pitching matchups here. But what I really like is South Carolina's bats at this point. Um, don't, I, I never expect a sweep ever. 
Um, really against almost anybody. Well, especially just, on the road. Yeah, that just add, yeah, and especially on the road. Um, but you'd like to get, you'd like to think that this is a, a more winnable road series for South Carolina. But set the tone tonight. And again, Eli's last outing was fantastic against Vanderbilt. I'll say this is a series that you're built to win. You it's know, uh, against starting pitching that isn't overbearing, yep. which a lot of staffs in the SEC are. So, I mean, while you might not, well, while you might be a little hesitant to say that you're favored to win the series or that you, I don't know, dare I say it, should win, this is when you're built to win. Mm -hmm. We could put it that way. I'll say this for Hess tomorrow night uh, and, and doing a little scouting on him. Uh, he is a strikeout pitcher. He's got 40 strikeouts in, in less than 25 innings pitched. Uh, but again, his ERA is over five. So y you feel like he's got some heat, but if he leaves it there, you can hit it. Very modern baseball. Yeah. Very strikeout, home run, three true outcome yeah. type pitcher. And and so again, I, I just I like what that could potentially mean for South Carolina, but that's why we play baseball. But again, tonight, seven forty five, Eli Jones versus Zane Adams. We'll have it for you here on the game. Speaking of baseball, today is opening day across the bigs. The Braves and Phillies were rained out. They actually announced that yesterday afternoon. Uh, so they will play tomorrow. And the reason I say they weren't going to play tomorrow. Uh, it was going to be today, then Saturday, Sunday. So now it'll just be a standard three game set. But uh, we do have games going on in the bigs this afternoon. Baltimore leads uh, the LA Angels. Are they the LA Angels? California Angels? Anaheim Angels? The Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Oh my God. Let's just call them I just, you know what? I like the old California Angels from when I was a kid. Well, because then they don't seem like, you know, the neglected stepchild of Los Angeles. Because Los yeah. Angeles has two of every sport, and yeah. usually the neglected one is cursed for having awesome rosters but never doing anything with them. And you know what? <laughs> Clippers, <laughs> Chargers. Anaheim's, I mean, it, you know, it is L.A., right? But it's not really L.A., so just go ahead and call it, like you said, the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, but they, it's Anaheim. Why did they ever stop calling it Anaheim? Or just the, or the California Angels. Just California Angels. Because you know who doesn't have that weird, neglected team moniker of them in pro sports in that area? The, the Anaheim Ducks. They've actually won a <laughs> Stanley Cup. You know what? Because they, and they know what they don't call themselves? The Los Angeles Ducks of Anaheim. Or the California That's Ducks. Dumb. Or the California <laughs> Ducks. They, they have been the Anaheim Mighty or Anaheim Ducks <laughs> forever. And it suited them well. They don't have that moniker attached to them. Well, what I'm going to call the Angels today is probably losers. Uh, again, they are they, they are, are losing, losers. They are losing big in Baltimore. By the way, can I can I say something here? Mike Trout hit a home run though. Uh, they're playing in Baltimore today. They are. Do you know what's about 90 minutes north of Baltimore? Philadelphia. <laughs> Where they're not playing baseball today. So Somebody, somebody, tell me what's going on here, please. Is uh, the Mason Dixon line got like a, like a bubble? You got a dome over us. I mean, what are we doing? Camden Yards, Boo. outdoor stadium. It is. And guess, guess what? Guess who's playing baseball right now? And they are. Let's see. Last time I checked, they were five innings into this game. Baltimore. They are now. I got top six. Yeah, they, yeah. They're, so we're, they're, we're they're through five. We're almost six innings. At this point, you can get rained out, and it still counts. Do me a favor real quick, will you? Check, check, check the current conditions in downtown Philadelphia, PA, please. Oh, boy. All right, you're going to love this. Because, again, Baltimore and Philly, not that far apart from one another. Bottom of the third in Chicago. Tigers lead the White Sox 1-0. Uh, we're tied at one in Kansas City between the Royals and Twins. Uh, Astros do play in a dome. And they lead New York, New York, the Yankees, that is, 4 nothing uh, down in Miami. Marlins, Pirates, 2-2 two -two in the third. By the way, that Astros-Yankees game is in the third as well. Uh, out west, bottom three, Giants at San Diego. San Francisco leads one nothing. Bottom one in L.A. The Dodgers lead the Cardinals one nothing. Uh, in the fourth in Tampa, nope, in St. Pete, excuse me. Uh, the Rays lead Toronto one nothing. And in Cincinnati, it's the Reds over the Nationals, three to nothing. Oh, it's in seven the third nothing inning. now. A martini home run. Oh my! It is seven nothing. All right, so your Reds. That's right. We're yeah. so back. Yeah, we're so back. There you go. Uh, current conditions in Philly? Fifty degrees and raining. It is raining in Light Philadelphia. Rain. Okay, but not raining in Baltimore. Nine per, nine mile per hour winds. Uh, the forecast for the rest of the night. Uh, no rain. Man. They could have just waited till like they five. They could have just waited. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's the Phillies. They did it on purpose, man. Ducking. Yeah, they are. 
They didn't want, they didn't want to play yet. They only want to play them in October. That's it. I guarantee you, Zach Wheeler went and said, I, I need another day of rest. He goes, hey, guys, Elijah Campbell drafted me as his first pitcher in the fantasy baseball. He needs me at my, at my best, right? My best is on Friday. So they made the call, and they said for the greater good, for the EBPI, and for everything else, that they're going to let Zach start on Friday. Thank you, Zach. We continue with our integrated media headlines of the day. Uh, we look north to Charlotte, where LaMelo Ball has been shut down due to an ankle injury. I say shut down for the rest of the year. Uh, to all eight of you Hornet fans in the area, you already know that your team is out of the playoffs for the eighth straight season. There are only 10 games left in the regular season. Um, LaMelo Ball is under contract through the 29 season. Uh, he got a five-year designated rookie max last summer. I still have the question I'm going to pose to Elijah Campbell. Has LaMelo Ball played his last game for the Charlotte Hornets? Nope. No. That is a, that is a uh, if you've ever seen the Bugs Bunny nope meme yeah, where sure. he's got you know the, his tongue at the very edge of yeah. his buck teeth and going, nope, yeah. that's me. Okay. It, this is a pretty... Pretty easy, no, because if you're going to trade him, in theory, because he is on contract, like you said, till what, 2029? Yeah. If you were to trade him, what does that involve, Jay Phillips? Uh, getting something in return? That's one. That is part of a trade. Paying him? Getting somebody else to want to pay him. Ah. And you know what? When you're a turnstile on defense, you better be averaging about 30 points a game. He got, uh, let me go, 23.9. So not quite there, huh? Yep, and it only takes him about 20 shots a game to do it. Ooh. He doesn't play good defense. He has now gotten to the point where he's almost an average three-point shooter. He's at 35.5%. The league average is close to 36. So he's still slightly below average three-point shooter. Takes a lot of shots. Turns the ball over almost four times a game. Has about eight assists a game. Why, why did he get a rookie max? Because of the Hornets. That, that's why. Because the Charlotte Hornets Does are David the Does David Tepper own the Hornets? You would think. You'd think. It's almost like they're like, oh, this kid has some type of star potential. Let's give him all the money we have. Let's give him all of it. Oh, man. They thought he was Trey Young for a little bit. And even even Trey Young, I don't know how what, what trade value you can get for him because also turnstile on defense also. There's a connection there shot. because Trey Young used to play for the Hawks and, and like one of the Hawks owners the now. Hawks. Well, the, yeah, uh, and, and now one of the Hawks owners owns the Hornets. Yeah, it's uh, there's something there. I don't know what there. it is. Yeah, granted, Lamelo Ball is still very young. He's barely old enough to drink. He can get better. However, I don't know if I would have invested think that drinking much would money. Help? Um, it helps some people. <laughs> Michael Jordan used to own the team, and I'm sure Michael Jordan has some some pointers on uh, his favorite bourbons and what type of stuff he takes personally and what type of stuff he likes to gamble Even on. Even Lamelo can't afford what Michael drinks. Probably not. No, there's no way. There is zero way. Is there, like, the super-duper brand of Pappy Van Winkle that only, like, Jordan-type people can afford? Well, they probably make a certain batch that only Michael Jordan's allowed to it's access. Like one barrel of yeah. it that Michael gets. A barrel. Yeah. 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 It is a barrel. Well, uh, like the Panthers, man, I'm, uh, you Hornet fans, I'm pulling for you. Terrible. I'm they pulling for you. And now, and now they're talking about Charlotte wanting a Major League Baseball team. How about we take care of the teams that are in Charlotte right now? Yeah. How about we make a playoff somewhere? Yeah. I mean. Or a tournament, if you will. Goodness gracious. Finally, as we uh, conclude our integrated media headlines of the day, congratulations once again to Camden's Joyce Edwards. She has been named the 2024 20, uh, Gatorade National Basketball Player of the Year. Uh, she beat out, listen to this, they, they, they look at ultimately nearly a half million college basketball players. And obviously you weed out the, the elite of the elite to get to the super elite. And then you get somebody like Joyce Edwards, uh, the second-ranked overall recruit in the country, the two-time South Carolina Player of the Year. Uh, this past season for Camden, 31.3 points, 13.3 boards, four and a half steals, and four assists as Camden won the state championship. Um, she's, uh, she's just a brilliant player. She also won a gold medal for the United States in the Under-19 World Cup last year. Uh, only one of only two high school players on that roster. She will join Coach Don Staley's team next school year. Uh, the second Gatorade National Player of the Year that the Gamecocks uh, have signed under Don Staley. So congratulations to Joyce Edwards. A tremendous honor. And as we said, uh, another now in a long line of really not just South Carolinians, but local players. Uh, Elena Coates, Asia Wilson, Ashlyn Watkins, Malaysia Fulwiley, you know, all basically greater Columbia. And let's face it, Camden. 
when you just head out 20 east. Camden's basically now Greater Columbia, too. I know you Camden people don't like that. I get it. Um, I get you My Camden trouble. friends, I got Camden friends, but uh, it's close enough, right? We're going to call her local these days. It only takes about a half hour to get there. Congratulations, Joyce. That's a big deal. And that is our integrated media headlines of the day. Speaking of big deals or small deals, if you've got like a quick job, you know, like you got that new video doorbell, you're like, I thought I knew how to do this, but I don't. But I already bought it. What do I do? 803-948-8327. Integrated media will be happy to help you out. But you also might say, man, I want a full home entertainment system 803-948-8327 something in between they can do it for you too whatever it is around the house like that technologically speaking they'll help you out love what they've done for me you'll love what they can do for you my great friends at integrated media looking forward to being out there in a couple of weeks to play some golf at pro swing ahead of that tournament across the river that way know what i mean called my friends at integrated media gamecock spring football notes on the other side you're listening to the post game show
Nah, definitely. Uh, them boys are looking good. Everybody's fast, man. Fast, shifty, everything. And uh, they processing and learning to play is very fast as well, too. I've been impressed uh, first couple of days seeing everybody being able to just know exactly what they're doing. Like, we'll put an install in, and they already know what's going on. So I'm impressed. Debo Williams, linebacking help is coming in. Uh, Shane Beamer is encouraged. Clayton White encouraged by some of the numbers at that position. That's Debo on what the new guys have already been doing in the first week of spring drills. Welcome back into the postgame show. Jay Phillips and Elijah Campbell with you. Appreciate you being with us. Uh, a few Gamecock defenders have been speaking uh, here in the last day or two. I uh, want to get to somebody we talked about yesterday in terms of, of leadership uh, and that's cuts eight and nine here. We'll go in those orders, Elijah. Uh, Alex Huntley of Columbia, speaking of kids that are local to the area, he is quite local. Uh, first, uh, Alex answering the question on why he's back on the Carolina D-line. Um, a couple things, you know, I think uh, just being able, to, I'm lucky to have the opportunity to come back. And so just being able to do that, that's something I had to jump on, you know, just better, you know, my, my own self. But most importantly, there's just a lot of work that can be done and that a lot of work that can be done really fast. So I feel that we have a team that is right there and we, we gain so much at so many different positions and, and just whether that's from the coaches, the knowledge. And so from everything we're just learning and gaining, it, I just see so much potential in the team, in the room, everywhere. And so I want to be a part of that. I want to help do things that South Carolina has never done before. And so I just think that we can do that this year and I, I want to be a part of that. And, you know, certainly improve his own stock, which uh, is always what, what some of these guys want to do. Uh, Boogie was also asked on uh, about what he and the defense are trying to get best at in spring ball. Well, like you said, we're still early in spring ball. You know, we're, we don't have a game for a while, so we really get to focus on ourselves. And so just one of the things, especially in spring ball, I'm, I'm sure a lot of places, but just effort, intensity, energy, stuff like that, there's things that don't really need a, a certain scheme because we're not necessarily game planning for anybody right now. We're not doing anything of that sort. We're just being able to really work on ourselves, dial in on the little things. I know for me personally, hand placement, stuff like that. So each person has their own individual things they need to work on. And then as a team, just seeing out there what everybody can do, you know, watch guys make plays and just have fun. Boogie Huntley, one of Carolina's captains, again, uh, a local product from Hammond and uh, into his redshirt senior season here at Carolina. Uh, another guy that's a veteran coming over from Georgia Tech and a lot of people excited about Kyle Kennard playing on the edge. Big kid, 6'5", uh, close to 250 pounds. Uh, this is Kyle just about transitioning into the Gamecock defense. Um, which is a testament to these guys that's already been here. Uh, it's, it's been nothing like stabbing on toes. It's been a, a seamless integration of uh, players and, and, and scheme and, and, and our different skill sets. Uh, it's been no, no type of animosity. It's just been like, you come in and I make them better and they make me better and we're going to mesh together. So come August when we're time to play o, ODU and every other team, we're on the same page. I'm going to say, just because Alex also mentioned no game for a while, and he just mentioned Old Dominion as the, the opener, it would be nice to have an exhibition game in the spring. Because yeah, he did specifically say, you know, there's no game for be what, nice. six months. Just say. Would be cool. Just say. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, here, to, I'm here to keep pushing for, for a that. game. Ah, that's right. And again, with, with mitigating factors, I'm, I'm here for that too. With a field goal kickoff uh, to determine a winner if we're tied. Sure. Like right. a shootout. Again, no blitzes, no kickoffs, no punt returns. A fourth down contest. Yeah. But against somebody else. Love That'd it. be fun. I'm here for that. Uh, one more from Kyle, uh, how he is meshing with Sterling Lucas up front. I said this before. Um, I feel like everything that he told me that was was going to happen when, when we were, I was here as far as the way he coaches me and the knowledge he gives me and how consistent he is with the things he tells me every day, I feel like it's been the same one day one since I stepped on campus. Uh, he's been a big part of the reason I've developed just in the short time of being when I first got here to being here now. So, like, big kudos to Coach Lucas, which is another big reason why I'm here now. Depth up front uh, is, a, is a big deal. There's a lot of guys on that edge now. If I count how they uh, consider edge guys, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven players at edge, plus a couple of guys that can interchange their roles. So depth. Listen, and Shane, uh, if y'all haven't seen it yet, again, a really good interview that, that, that Shane Beamer did with Josh Pate of CBS Sports. And Josh has a really good podcast. It comes out a couple times a week. Um, 
but Shane uh, and Josh sat down for like a 45 minute interview. But one of the things that Shane stressed more than anything else that he and the staff knew they must do is simply get deeper. Now, again, you've got the bodies, so you always have the numbers. All right. You get 85 plus walk ons, but he knows they've got to get more quality depth. And I said, I mean, I've said that, you know, like I always say more good players and it's never uh, it's never meant as a knock on what you've got. But but every program, every program needs more good players, whether it's Georgia or Ohio State or whether it's Georgia State or Ohio Wesleyan. All right. Everybody needs more good players and and Shane and the staff do feel that especially with what they can do through the portal that they are they're they're doing that now that you become slightly injury proof yeah. right I mean especially on the line defensive line offensive line Both I think sides. they learned a lesson last year that if you're struggling with depth at the offensive line that can completely derail your season regardless of who else is on the roster and I think that's the one big thing that when we look back on the 2023 South Carolina Gamecocks we look at that offensive line and not having a consecutive starting same starting unit for back-to-back weeks uh, until late November. Yeah, um, that'll do and, it. And that's one of the things Shane mentioned to, to Josh this week as well. And he he told you and me this too. You know, I mean, um, they they really took a hard look through strength and conditioning and training at why so many offensive line injuries occurred. And I think that is crucial. And we heard from from others that, that you and I speak with a lot about that. Like you've got to really focus in on why that happened. That's not that's not coincidence. You know, there there was something there. And what they learned, you know, Shane will be, you know, maybe a little more forthcoming in the uh when he when he has other opportunities to do that. But they, they needed to take a hard look at it. But they do feel that quality depth is there. We'll see. It's got a hard schedule, man. It's got a hard schedule. Uh one more. Speaking of local kids, Nick Him and Worry is one of those. And uh some of the things that they are taking from last season to try to improve on uh, the biggest thing I learned is probably like you never really you never really get like get a grasp of the game until you like you actually play a lot because like last year coming to the season that was like my first spring so like this is my second spring now cause I, I enrolled in summer my freshman year so like last year was my first spring and I thought I like had things down pat and stuff but really I really didn't so you never really think you have it and just like keep staying stay with like an open mindset and like keep trying to like find the things you can get better at and never think you like got things under control. So there you go. Gamecocks uh, finishing up the first week of spring. They've got a weekend off for Easter. Spring game is April the 20th. So about th- three weeks from Saturday, the Garnet and Black spring game at williams Bryce. Uh, these kind of things are never easy, and this is just coming into us here. Uh, it is indirectly related to Carolina football. But former Gamecock quarterback uh, Chris Smelly, who, of course, transferred over uh, back to his home state uh, at-, at Bama to play baseball, now 37. Uh, he's coaching football, but he... Uh, He's gone missing in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, went out in a kayak this morning around 8.30, and the Walton County, Florida Sheriff's Department says there is a massive search underway. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, the South Walton Fire District, have been sending jet skis into the water off of Grayton Beach, Florida, looking for Chris. The Coast Guard uh, out of Mobile, Alabama, has been notified, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Agency has also launched a a, a team from Destin Pass uh, heading towards Grayton Beach. And again, this was around 8.30 this morning when he went out and uh, has not returned at this point in time. Uh, That is all we have right now. Um, And certainly, I I know Gamecock fans, Tide fans, anybody, I mean, this is just a scary situation and 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 hopefully this uh this is all taken care of soon uh, any updates we will certainly provide you and uh just be thinking about chris and his family and hoping that those authorities who are very good at what they do can uh, can take care of this but um thinking about chris smelly who's 37 years old coaching football now so uh, we'll be we'll be thinking about chris all right um we'll come back on the other side drive around the sec more to do as the thursday post game show continues
From the WIS Traffic Studios, I'm Elijah Campbell. A couple of accidents to report to you that are causing some delays on the roadways this afternoon. We're going to start here in Richland County. A disabled vehicle has the right lane completely blocked on I-26 eastbound after the Columbia Avenue exit, exit 91. Right lane completely blocked, traffic moving very slowly. And then in Columbia on South Carolina, 277 southbound after I-20, we have an accident that has blocked the two right lanes. So on 277 southbound after I-20, we have two lanes blocked completely. We have a couple of accidents that have been cleared. There was one on I-20 westbound at Wilson Boulevard. That one is cleared as as well as one on I-26 eastbound at I-20 near exit 107B and on I-26 westbound at Broad River Road in the Ballantine exit, exit 101. And it is drive around the SEC time on this Thursday. Welcome back in. Jay and Elijah with you. Let me uh, once again remind you of the pitching matchups for Carolina and Alabama this weekend. This is a Thursday through Saturday series in Tuscaloosa. So we'll start tonight uh, about two hours away from uh, from airtime. It's an 8 o'clock Eastern first pitch. Uh, Eli Jones goes for the Gamecocks tonight 2-0. A 2-3-5 ERA, 30 and two-thirds innings pitch, seven walks, 23 strikeouts. Zane Adams is a freshman lefty for Bama. He is 2-1 and one with a 4-2-6, 19 innings pitch. He also uh, has given up seven walks, just 12 strikeouts on the young season. Dylan Eskew, junior righty, will go tomorrow for Carolina against another junior righty, Ben Hess. Uh, Dylan's ERA, 3.81, 2 and 2 on the season. Hess is 3-1 and one with a 5-1-1 ERA. Uh, so that'll be an interesting one on uh, tomorrow night. And then Saturday afternoon, Tyler Pitzer, who was the freshman of the week in the conference for his brilliant performance against Vandy. He's 4-0, a .48 ERA. Uh, Greg Ferrone, a very good senior lefty for Bama, 3-0 with a 2-4-9. Um, so that'll be interesting. Uh, th- those guys are very similar, too. Uh, Pitzer, 18 and two-thirds, seven walks, 29 strikeouts. Uh, Ferrone. 25 and a third, only five walks issued and 28 strikeouts. Again, I, I like what Carolina's offense can do in this one. Um, we'll see. I, again, there's 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 things to like about what you're what you're hitting versus their pitching looks like. It does sound like it can be pretty feast or famine too. High strikeout guys that if you do get the ball in play, it's a lot of times that ball goes pretty far. So. Uh, I think we could we could have some high variance here in these next three games. Kind of what it feels like. Uh, the rest of the conference baseball schedule looks like this. Uh, we've got uh, three other Thursday through Saturdays because of the holiday weekend. Not everybody's doing it, but most of the conferences. Auburn will be at Texas A&M this weekend starting tonight. Missouri is at Vanderbilt starting tonight. There's a real chance for Vandy to get back on track after what happened in Columbia. I need it. Uh, the series of the weekend without question in the conference, and there's a lot of good series all the time, but LSU is traveling to Arkansas this weekend. LSU just coming off uh, losing two of three at home to Florida, and Arkansas not real happy that they lost game three to Auburn after having beaten Auburn in the first two. I think they were thinking, they were probably thinking sweet. Oh, yeah. That's not not the dog Auburn, but Arkansas was probably thinking sweet. And Auburn, you know, for them, they are thinking they're lucky stars because that is the only they're SEC only. win. They avoided two straight sweeps exactly. to start their season. Exactly. Uh, Conference season, really. Tomorrow, Georgia uh, and Tennessee in Knoxville, game one. State will be at Florida. Kentucky visits Ole Miss. Here's how things shake out right now in conference play. Uh, again, I'll give you conference standings only. Kentucky's 5-1 and one in the East. Carolina, Florida, 4-2. and two. Tennessee, Georgia, Vandy, 3-3. Three and three. Missouri is 1-5 and five out West. Arkansas is 5-1. and one. A&M and Mississippi State and Ole Miss are all 3-3. Three and three. Again, LSU, 2-4. Uh, and four. Come back around to them in a second. So is Bama. 
And as Elijah just said, Auburn just one in five on the season. LSU is not going to be favored to win this series in Fayetteville. Um, Arkansas is excellent, of course. Uh, they are five and one, 20 and three overall. Number one team in the country. Number, and the number one team in the country to boot, at least as, a, as much as that counts to you here in late March. Um, let's just say that Arkansas wins the series two games to one. Uh, LSU is looking at a three and six start for the first third, give or take there of conference play where where Arkansas would be seven and two uh, in the West. Now, again, there's things in the middle and LSU can certainly overcome that. LSU already has 20 wins like a lot of schools in the conference do, including the Gamecocks. But um, it just and listen, I, I can assure you that LSU was not real happy when when they when you get the opening draw in Florida, even if you get Florida at home, that you got Florida and Arkansas amongst your first two series. Yeah. Yeah. And, and games in which. uh could get pretty ugly. I mean, I think Florida almost run rolled them. If they yeah. didn't, I think they might. I think it did run roll them. They did in one that day. Last game. Yes, they yeah. did. They and, did and, one day. I think it was. Yeah. 15, I want to say it was fifteen to four, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, but it, I think this was. Well, I, it was a lot to not a lot. Yeah. How about that? I think that's a pretty accurate assessment of it. And if you're LSU, I mean, obviously there's some there's some chance for positive regression just because of the schedule, but that puts them in a very interesting spot, or at least a spot in which maybe uh, we should be paying attention to them to see if they end up bouncing back. From yeah. That. Uh, meanwhile, tonight in uh, men's basketball, just one SEC team will be playing. That is Alabama, uh, and they've got North Carolina. We'll go over that one again real quick from the uh, the EBPI standpoint. But this one uh, from the BPI, very tight, 50.3% North Carolina, 49.7%. Alabama, but you yeah. had a slightly different take. Yeah, I like uh, North Carolina 75% to Alabama 25. Uh, as good as Alabama's offense has been this year, it has slightly regressed over the last little bit. They were number one for a good chunk of the year. In the last two weeks, they have slipped to four nationally. Illinois has, uh, has surpassed them. A couple of other teams have surpassed them here in the tournament. And defensively, this is the same team that gave up 96 points to College of Charleston. College of Charleston, good team, Yep, but if you want to beat North Carolina, the team that's the outright ACC champion, a team that has a lot of players that were on the national runner-up team a couple of years ago with some talented transfers, a, a top-five roster in the sport, and that has oftentimes played like it, uh, if you want to compete with them, you can't have the same defensive performance you did when College of Charleston had 1.16 points per possession against you. You cannot. This game is also... At all. Uh, easily uh, got the highest over-under number attached to it mm -hmm. uh, at 174 and a half. Next is the Clemson Arizona game at 152 and a half. So I, Vegas is expecting fireworks. Here's the thing: I can see Alabama scoring 75 to 85 points in this game. I can see North Carolina breaking triple digits. Yeah, uh, that I, the guy. I know it's a four and a half point spread. But if I were in a state which I could legally put my money where my mouth is, I would take the spread at nine and a half for North Carolina. I wow. feel pretty good that they are going to beat Alabama. Well, you, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, Alabama just gives up lots of points. Yep. And like, and like they're okay with it, I think. I, I mean, I think they're okay with it. But at some point, that that's going to get you beat against a team that can that can match you. Mm -hmm. So uh, that one tips at nine thirty nine. At least scheduled for a nine thirty nine tip that will follow out in L A. The Clemson Arizona game. So figure about a 30 minute gap in between. Clemson Arizona is the first game of the night again in California. So I'm going to soapbox again one more time. Uh, so four o'clock in California, Bama and North Carolina around 6 30 in California. In Boston tonight uh, in the East region, Connecticut and San Diego State at 7 39, followed by <laughs> Illinois and Iowa State. In the Eastern time zone at 10.09 Eastern. Uh, time to start shotgunning some Mountain Dews, who, who, baby. Who are the ad wizards who came up with this one, as uh, a, a former Saturday Night Live skit once asked. Uh, we'll see. And then tomorrow, uh, Tennessee is the only other SEC team still alive. They will play late tomorrow, too. And uh, also in the Eastern time zone at 10 o'clock. Yeah, Friday night. <laughs> and that might be the best game of all eight. Yeah, Tennessee and Creighton tomorrow. Uh, the Vols' slight favorites over the Creighton Blue Jays. But that one will be tomorrow, and we'll talk more 
about that one. That's the drive around the SEC brought to you by Herndon Chevy, your hometown Chevy dealer. Stop by the showroom. See why Herndon makes you smile. We'll come back on the other side and uh, commemorate one of the great moments in the history of the NCAA tournament. We'll also update today's poll question. You're listening to the Post Game Show.
Welcome back in. Final few minutes of the postgame show on this Thursday. Uh, tomorrow on our program, uh, my good friend Mike Waddell will be with us. Mike is the former athletics director at Towson University in Maryland, former associate AD at Arkansas and Illinois. And uh, he's going to join Elijah and me. He was in the, the courtroom in Mecklenburg County in Charlotte last week when uh, FSU and the ACC were going at it. And uh, representatives of Disney and ESPN were there, too. There's been some new developments on that this week. Uh, Mike will have more. Now, he's now uh, working for the North Carolina Sports Radio Network. So uh, he will be joining us tomorrow with more on that. Speaking of tomorrow, uh, Elijah and I are going to make a cameo appearance, but Terry and Tyler are going to be live at Quaker Steak and Lube's uh, Bluff Road location down there. A lot of you see it when you're on the way to the stadium down there uh, south of the stadium near Heathwood. Uh, they've got the full travel center, restaurant, and bowling alley. So come have, come have lunch with us uh, tomorrow, noon to 3, during the halftime show. Looking forward to that. I'm going to bowl. I want to bring it. Uh, I'll, I'll bowl, I'll, I'll bowl a, a game with you. Time permitting. I've oh, got yeah. A, I've got a show to prep. We do? Eh, it's Friday. Meh. Yeah. Thinking about calling Brewer and talking about this kickoff thing, too. See, that would be really cool. I don't know if he's going out of town. Though. I haven't. I should have texted him today. Except I'm sitting here talking live on the air. like Planning hey, Brew, tomorrow's show live on air. Brew, if you're if you're uh, in the truck on the way home from work, do me a favor. Text me if you can do tomorrow around 3. Hit me up. Would be cool. Would love your thoughts. Uh, if not, we'll get him sometime very, very soon. Uh, in the meantime, 32 years ago today. You were likely, if you're old enough at least, watching and listening to this. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yes! We talked about a quick pass to half court. But with people playing behind Christian Leitner. dad was a football player and scored on a halfback pass two days after he was born finds Christian Leitner with a 50-foot pass and he puts it in from 15 for the game winner take a look at the Duke reaction Absolutely stunning. 104, 103 uh, in overtime in Philadelphia. Uh, Duke, the number one team in the country. Kentucky into, entered that game at number six. They were 29 and six. Coach K versus Patino, uh, both men at the height of their powers at that time. That game has been rated. I don't know if they've redone it, but there's not been a game that could surpass it at this point. Um, but that game has been rated in previous polls and studies or whatever you want to call them as the greatest game in the history of the NCAA tournament. Listen, those things are debatable. Depend I mean, I, I, that game was amazing. I still might put NC State's win over Houston above it, but I don't care. I'm not, I'm not here for that debate Semantics. right now. Yeah, you know, I mean, there have been some amazing finishes uh, and, and, and some terrific games. It, obviously, that's why, we, that's why America loves this tournament. But uh, that Kentucky team, they thought they were going to get it done, man. I mean, they, they had done everything necessary, and it took a prayer. And, again, if you can remember, it was a full, it was a near full court pass. It was a baseball pass. Yeah, it was a baseball yeah. pass. And Grant Hill threw it. But I can still see Thomas Hill on that team with his, yeah, with, the, with his hands on his head. Like, I, I, how did that just happen? And Leitner, Leitner, by the way, in that game was 10 for 10. I know a lot of people, listen, Christian Leitner was not the first in a long line of hated Duke players, hated primarily because of their prowess. Um, but he was a special, special college basketball player. And he was, here's the thing, man. Was he better than you? Yes. That's just it. He was just plain better than you almost mm -hmm. every night. And, and you know, that team for Kentucky was was terrific, man. I mean, again, Patino, they were, they were coming off some rough times. And 
and it was getting going. Of course, Rick would ultimately lead him to a title a couple of years later and then head off to the NBA again. But uh, but it was building. It was definitely yeah. building. But that Kentucky team had played so hard, they were not supposed to win. This was not necessarily what you would call an even matchup, even if it's teams like Duke and Kentucky. Duke was better. I mean, they were. I think Duke, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, Duke was just just better. Uh, and, of course, Duke was on their Foster way at that point better. to their to their second consecutive championship um and, you know coach k had such a remarkable run of not getting it done before 91 and 92 but i i, I can still tell you I, mean, I was sitting at our place down about a mile and a half behind me here on south bull street with a bunch of buddies uh, I'll, I'll that was amazing and the shot before that which is one of the wildest the uh, the bank shot for kentucky to give them the lead yeah was a prayer in itself, yeah. which would uh, which would have gone down as a shot just as famous as Leitner's if Leitner didn't just one up it the next play. And it's I think the most underrated part of that entire play is he had the wherewithal to know that he had a shoulder fake and a dribble that he could still use at his disposal. A lot of guys catch the ball with that much time left and they want to chuck one up. You know, he caught the ball, landed, shoulder fake, took a dribble, spin, shot in that small amount of time, and drilled it. That was that, that's about as as poised as you could be in that situation. Yeah, and and you know I don't I don't mean to equate the two directly in terms of the 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 overall just massive importance, but that was the East Regional Final. So Duke had to still go in in the Final Four. That was just to get to the Final Four, kind of like you know when America beat the Russians, they had to win another. They game. had to win another game, you know. But you still just remember that one because of, of how amazing that it was. Good stuff today. Thanks to David Kloniger and Brad Muller for joining us. We'll have more coverage from Albany tomorrow as well. See you then.